talent okay. they've got. Perfect. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's begin our meeting. And I'm going to turn it over to Brandon uh, to start the to start the discussion. And uh, may the rest of you. No. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's another discussion. The, uh, so just, just so you know, in your uh, handouts for today, we also included a just kind of a one-pager of your calendar year 2019, the anticipated street project, the priority uh, levels that uh, Clay discussed last week in the CIP presentation. Thank you, Clay, for putting this together wherever you are. There he is right there. Let's give Clay a round of applause. <laughs> So, and we are working on kind of general responses to uh, the questions that you had uh, last week. We've got most of them answered at this point. We're just waiting on one or two more um, to get resolved, and then we'll be sending that to you out uh, via memo. So you'll get that uh, sometime early, probably this next, this upcoming week. Uh, so as we uh, kind of get into today is the the wrap up session uh, for uh, the fiscal year 2020 budget. I uh, wanted to kind of just touch on a couple of highlights from our last uh, from our last meeting uh, when we covered both the operating and the capital budget in one meeting uh, with that. But just uh, as a refresher uh, for you, this uh, budget that we're presenting to you uh, this time is, uh, complies with city policies for uh, reserve levels, also for liquidity, um, and it also maintains the city's tax levy rate at $16.78 per $1,000 of taxable value. Um, we've talked about an increased focus on some of the police services, <clears throat> keeping that higher staffing level uh, with the additional four level or four police officers that we uh, instituted in fiscal year 19, um, making sure that we have minimum or increasing those minimum staffing levels for patrol shifts, and then the formation of a new gun investigation unit. Um, we also are taking a look at the, the CIP last week. We, you know, kind of some of the highlights from that: 34 million dollars in streets and sewer projects coming up in fiscal year 2020. Uh, and then $141 million in streets and sewers over the six-year CIP right now anticipated for that. Obviously, the first year is the only one that's funded, right? But that's what we're looking forward to right now as we look to uh, put more money into streets and sewers over the six-year program in total. And also, just one of the, the better pieces of news, strong economic growth at 4.4% last year on our tax base growth. Uh, that's the second year of, of really strong uh, tax base, base gro growth here in the city. Um, and that obviously makes things a little bit easier as we're trying to provide the necessary services uh, to the community. Uh, we've been through a kind of a long process, uh, you know, staff-wise and city council, uh, city council involvement. First of all, we want to thank all of you for your leadership during this uh, during this time, as we've uh, asked for uh, feedback for your priorities and things like that. We uh, greatly appreciate everyone participating in those uh, in those sessions and in those different surveys that we've put out. Um, we start all the way at the very beginning of kind of a general kickoff, uh, making sure that all the departments are involved in inputting their budgets for the year, uh, reviewing everything with them, and then obviously then a public review and a review with the city council uh, is the format that we've, we've used. Uh, that brings us to a total uh, proposed budget for fiscal year 2020, right now of $226.7 million. Uh, for that, but it's almost an 8% increase over the previous year. The majority of that is because of the increase in the CIP budget of a little bit over 21% uh, for the year. Um, as again, as we discussed last last week, there are a couple of fees that are increasing uh, as, as we talk about that. So the sewer fee is going up by about $8.11 per quarter. The city council has already approved that, so that one's already uh, moving forward. As part of the budget, you also then approve the 3% increases in the garbage fee and the clean water fee of $1.44, uh, $1.44, sorry, for garbage, and then uh, uh, and then about 24 cents per quarter on that ERU for the clean water Brandon, fee. Brandon, if you would, just reiterate again the part of our commitment to the uh, proactivity related to uh, <coughs> Department of Natural Resources and all so forth that have a long-term plan that this helps us be able to fund. Good, yeah. So the city council has, and, and the city of Davenport has, has significant costs uh, that are related to that IDNR consent order that we have. Essentially, that gives us permission to treat water and to continue to hook up users to that system. Uh, it would be a very bad thing to not be able to allow users to hook up to our sewer system. That means that as a city, we wouldn't be able to grow uh, with that. So we, we want to comply with that consent order so that we continue to add new users to our sewer system and adding capacity at the end of the day and making sure that the water that's being returned to the Mississippi River is cleaner uh, and, and that it is, you know, that environment, environmentally is meeting the regulations that it needs to uh, with that. That takes a lot of investment. The city council has been very dedicated to that over the year of small incremental increases over time to help pay for these things uh, that come up. The city, uh, there is a series of projects, um, over $20 million of projects over the next couple of years as we start to institute some of those at the water, water pollution control plant. 
uh, these increases will help pay for that. So obviously, we've seen a lot of increases. You've, you've all noticed a lot of increases in your own areas where you know we get heavy rainfall events. We aren't getting nearly as many backups, just a couple of them, if any, during significant rain events. That's a significant improvement than where we were about 10 years ago when we'd have m m many more uh, backups during those heavy rain events. So I and think we've consented, made a lot of progress. And the consent order also is coupled with better efficiencies as part of the way we do business, too. So Absolutely. it's a hand-in-hand -hand process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yep. Oh, it's 20, uh, I don't see Jim Odin here right now. Uh, it's like $21,000, $22,000 per year for a family of four or something like that. I, I think is what it is. Uh, we can get to that number if, if you'd like to, to, to see what it is. Yeah. It, and it moves every year uh, on that. But that's a good point. You do. Uh, it, the, the fees rem remain to be, or continue to be uh, free for anyone who is below that poverty line. And, and anyone, if you run across anyone who is questioning about that, whatever it is, they should just contact the revenue division here. There's a quick application that they fill out for that, and then we, we uh, remove them from that billing process. Okay. Uh, so what does that look like for a median household in Davenport? Um, property taxes, we discussed because of the rollback uh, moving for uh, property taxes. If your home stays the exact same value as it was uh, last year, it means that the Daven city of Davenport will receive $27.05 more in taxes from you during that year. Um, obviously, everyone's individual home situation varies, so as you look at that, you kind of have to look and see if your values go up, down, um, and kind of what happens there. Yeah. And that is an us. Correct. Yeah, yeah that, that's a state of Iowa rollback that is provided. That was us. The sewer fee uh, is going up by $32.44 for the year. Solid waste fee, $5.76, and then the clean water fee, a little less than a dollar, for a total impact to the resident, residents of about $66.21 on there for the median household. Okay. The budget continues to be focused on public safety and emphasizes public safety. Take a look here, but between the general fund and the trust and agency fund, which is, which is how those things are funded. Public safety is funded from those funds. You there are no other uh, uh, legal levy sources to use for that purpose. Everything else is restricted in a way that prevents you from using it for public safety. Uh, with that, uh, you can see 63% of that is dedicated to public service or public safety uh, on there. Uh, so the lion's share of those funds are used for those services. It also continues to focus on that, that, that sustainable infrastructure. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the, the importance of the $34 million in, in fiscal year 2020, 141 over the six years, um, but also something we didn't quite emphasize uh, you know, as much of last time, $6.2 million in continued in city assets, buildings, and equipment uh, for fiscal year 2020, making sure that, that our employees have, you know, uh, the, the buildings are going to last us. We're not going to have major problems with the buildings, um, but also making sure that our equipment is being replaced so that we're being as efficient as we can out as we're working work as we're doing work around the community. As you take a look at how that pie kind of generally gets cut up again, uh, the streets and the sewer system, that's where the lion's share of the CIP is uh, this year and, and continues to remain a major focus uh, for us as we put together the, the plan for the year. Covering just a couple of projects just because, uh, you know, the ones that had the highest priority level that I think are closest, that we think are closest with the city council's goals and priorities for the year. Uh, and, and the work plan as well. We have the urban revitalization at $500,000 for next year as we continue to work through that with the city council. Uh, the freight house deck replacement uh, is, is a great project for this year. Uh, it's coming in. Uh, 2020, uh, we continue to have Main Street landing improvements. Corey will talk about that a little bit more during her presentation on the work plan, but a million dollars for that and a million dollars throughout the CIP for every year uh, for that for funding. Uh, the 1930s sanitary sewer, that's a significant project going on in the city um, uh, on, on that one. Big dollar amount attached to that one, $7.7 .7 million uh, over uh, over a couple of years as we finish that one up. Uh, 53rd Street, we apologize now for the inconvenience uh, that will cause the motoring public, uh, but that's a great project that will uh, th that will really enhance that area and in the end make traffic a little bit easier for everyone. It's great when it's done. Absolutely. <laughs> what was that? Mm -hmm. And, and the Use Veterans, yeah, yep, yeah, Use Veterans Memorial Parkway is a great uh, pass through on that one. It's good to note too for again for that for 53rd street we're talking over time over 10 million dollars so yeah this is a significant not only in this year but in subsequent years when you add all that up that's almost it's ten and a half million dollars so Absolutely. that's yeah. a big commitment and we understand how that will impact our citizens positively when we get it all done yeah and, and again this this project was directed by the city council as, as the council wanted to focus more on ma maintenance projects with those by state funds that's really where that's really where the direction for 53rd has come from, and and so th this is a significant investment on a major maintenance project here in the city of Davenport, 
uh, for you as opposed to kind of before where we had been building a lot of new roads, the council wanted to shift direction and say, we want more maintenance on these roads. That's how that project got in there, got funded, it's, but it's now time to actually do the project uh, on that, so that's exciting. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the city's, like city's portion, yeah, yeah, the city's I, portion is, is correct, yeah, city's portion is only 2.6, right? Yeah. Exactly, yep, we love those types of projects. Yeah. Uh, the high uh, volume street repair, uh, $4.6 million. That's the highest I've ever seen that number uh, on that. So that's great as we continue to uh, do projects around the city of Davenport. Last year, last week, we had a conversation about the neighborhood streets and that repair program. What we've done is we've, we've renamed it and kind of put everything into that one category of just neighborhood streets. That allows us the flexibility to be able to do wh whatever type of street type it is, whether it's concrete, asphalt, brick, um, gravel, it came up last week as well. The ones that, that come, hit the priorities are the ones that we want to address. Uh, so thank you for your feedback on that when we've made that change. Mm -hmm. It's already getting out. People have already told me to tell you all thank you for the 46 and Fillmore intersection. They're already paying attention. Okay. So that will be in that section. Sure. All right. I won't cover this again, uh, but but just as, as a, you know, as we continue to look at that, those budget highlights, uh, this is a, a, you know, in my opinion, a great budget, I think, that's going to continue to move this community forward. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to uh, to get started with it as we uh, move closer to July 1 uh, on that. And, uh, and ultimately, you'll have a, uh, a public hearing uh, that's coming up on February 13th for the, uh, for this. And then it will move forward to the second cycle in February is when the actual adoption of the budget will be presented to you. And with that, we're now going to hear from the library. Uh, so we have a couple of this as we kind of move forward. We're going to hear from the library on some updates uh, there neighborhood services uh, on their first full year of, uh, of performance as a codified department of the city of Davenport. Uh, and then from there, we'll move into the city administrator's work plan. So yeah, I want to talk with you about community outreach today. We are putting in a lot of extra effort um, into community outreach um, as part of the library strategic plan. Um, so if you remember, um, we were in the second year of the current um, three-year strategic plan. Two main takeaways that we had when we were putting that plan together, for those of you who were at some of the sessions, you remember that um, we had a lot of public comment and, and some other city leaders saying, you know, you should offer e-books. Well, we do offer e-books. You should <laughs> do these kinds of programs. Well, we're doing those kinds of programs. So clearly there was um, some disconnect um, with the residents in terms of um, what we do, and um, we also know and we learned from those sessions that a lot of our residents simply can't get to the library. So there are a lot of reasons for that, um, but there are just a lot of people who don't get to the library. So one of the main goals coming um, out of those efforts on the strategic plan is to increase access and awareness of library materials, programs, and services. So community outreach is our, our solution to doing that. Um, the first steps that we took in the first year of the plan, um, we um, employed an AmeriCorps staff member um, to do outreach to things like stepping stones, um, daycares, food pantries. Um, they went up to J.B. Young um, for that food pantry. Um, we found that those were very popular and folks running those programs kept asking for more and then they asked for more and then we had more classes that were interested in that. So clearly there was a need there um, that that staff was fulfilling. Um, our customer services staff, that's basically our circulation um, staff, they did a lot of the events <coughs> that were really more community awareness events. Um, so getting out in the community to talk about the summer reading program and other um, things like that, signing folks up for library cards. Um, we did a really increase our efforts, especially in social media and other marketing um, to again get that word out into the community. And then the council um, funded um, our outreach vehicle um, in this current fiscal year and that is on order. So um, we're really excited about that too. Yes, sir. There's a food pantry at Central every Friday afternoon. Okay. Is it a... We'll um, put that on our list. <laughs> <laughs> it's an outreach vehicle, <coughs> kind of like a bookmobile kind of thing? It's not a bookmobile. It's a, um, it's a large Sprinter van that's customized with a lift and uh, with tie downs so that we can roll carts on okay. the lift, get them down to bring materials. It will have a, um, a 30... 30 unit um, charging station for computers, oh. Chromebooks, things like that. I'll have a TV, you'll have an awning that we can pull out. Um, 
to okay. take programs into parks. I've already had conversation with Chad about how we can do things um, with parks department. Yeah, I'm, parks I'm and thinking if, um, if, if you know what its schedule is going to be when you start it in operation, you could post that so that people can say, oh, it's going to be near me here and, and make mm -hmm. their plans accordingly. Yeah, and some of those sessions will really be public, you know, you know, come one, come all kinds of things um, in various places, but some will be specifically focused at um, taking materials to some of the senior centers, um, taking materials to um, daycares, classrooms, mm -hmm. things like that. So some of those won't be um, quite as public. But yeah, whenever we're doing something public, we'll... Amy, it might not be a bad idea to, to uh, reach out to some of the not-for-profits that are doing summer programs because of the summer reading loss and the just general reading uh, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge loss during the summer. That would be a great way to be able to help them focus on that too. So yeah. thanks, yeah. that's good. And you know, once we have the vehicle, um, it has an amazingly long, long lead time. They said seven or eight months from the time we signed the contract. So unfortunately, we won't have it for the start of um, the summer season this year. Maybe by July or August, we'll certainly reach out to you and Great. you know within your individual wards, um, what good places are that we could take it. Maybe what was the total investment on the van? It was one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. certainly be getting statistics on it and, and seeing where we go with it. And you're going to run the, the book and appeal with no additional staff? Right? Correct, yeah, and we'll, <coughs> we'll talk next about um, how we're um, going to be creating a, a specific community outreach department um, to, to work with that. So, um, so this is just one example of some of the things that, that they do. Um, we take crafts and, and um, sign-up materials and things like that to the farmer's market all summer. Um, so. This year, we took the next step to form a community outreach department. So it's a small department, staffed with one supervisor, full-time library assistant, and a part-time principal clerk. Um, we pulled those positions from other positions within the library. Um, as some of our, um, our, some of our work has changed, um, for example, um, a full-time um, cataloger position in our technical services department, as we add more and more ebook. We don't need quite as much time in that department, so we pulled a full-time position from that department, replaced it with a part-time 25-hour week position, just did some um, creative shuffling around with that. Um, and then the addition of um, the Mobius service, and I don't know if any of you are aware of that, um, so that's a contract we have with an, another really large library consortium for interlibrary loan. So we had been doing that um, in a very labor-intensive way. It's one of our most popular services. We were having about between three or four hundred items a month that our patrons um, were requesting from libraries all over the country. Um, this service allows that to be much more user friendly for our patrons, and even more importantly, it works just like the whole system, so it doesn't require 20 hours a week of customer service staff time. So we were able to take that staff time um, into this other position. So, um, so that was, so that was a win win. <coughs> So it, it helps us kind of replace that. So the old Prairie Cat system, as everyone remembers, was a really large library consortium in Illinois that we were part of. Um, Mobius is a very similar system. It's based out of Missouri. and um, But our library system can integrate with that. So um, if our patrons search the catalog and it comes up and there's nothing, you know, nothing that satisfies that request for that title, um, there is a message that comes up that says, nothing available here, search the Mobius catalog. You just click on that, and it automatically does the search for you, um, shows whether or not there's any items there. If there are, you just log in like usual and place a hold, and it just works like um, the regular hold system. And we already have a courier service that was bringing materials through that system. Um, if you don't find it there, it still, it takes you one step further. It says, nothing found here at Mobius. Click here to search through Prospector. Prospector is a large system um, in Colorado, includes the, Dem uh, the Denver Public Library and some other large systems. And again, if they find holdings there, um, click to place the hold, and it works just like the Prairie Cat system did. So, and we did just learn in the next couple months the St. Louis County Public Library, which is a, another huge system, will be joining that, adding another two million items available. So that was a really a win-win for everybody, I think, you know, better <laughs> service and saved us some staff time. So. 
So the operational details of that department, so all of our outreach efforts will be coordinated through um, that department, which really simplifies um, responsibility for the vehicle. We won't have various departments, you know, scheduling different things and finding out we're over oversubscribed or that somebody forgot to put gas in it, um, those kinds of things. Um, and then we've placed our outreach and our customer service and our community engagement and learning departments all under the same supervisor or um, under the um, assistant director. So we know we're going to have to um, share staff um, just like we always have, that there will be events, outreach events, that we just don't have enough staff with this small department to go to. Um, but that will make it really easy to um, borrow staff from other departments. So just some extra about why is outreach so important? So there are lots and lots of studies <coughs> that show that access to books is an important ed indicator of educational success. And again, we know that a lot of our residents can't um, come to the library. Um, a lot of them lack transportation, and a lot of them because of work schedules, single parent families, working a couple shifts. Um, when you've got a few extra hours, um, your top priority might not be to get to the library. So if we can get services to those families um, where their kids are involved in daycare, after school programs, all those kinds of things, um, I think it's important to be able to do that. So another example, um, our, our um, customer services staff um, got in contact with somebody who was um, responsible for the Laundry Love event um, where <coughs> low income families can um, ac get access to free laundry services. Um, on a Saturday and while everybody was busy doing their laundry there were a lot of kids there with not very much to do so they took some crafts um, read some stories and um, again good positive activities for the kids to get involved in um, and probably gave the parents a break while they were trying to get other things done it's just kind of like a nice program where you know we're going to where the people are come to school with you know, confidence in some of the people in the room and, and mm -hmm. things like that. This is such a big deal that we can talk about and we, I'd love to see how we can increase this. Okay, yeah, so so we don't do laundry love. So so this is just, this I is an event that's already happening that we were part of. <laughs> but for kids too, yeah. mm -hmm. I don't, that's mm -hmm. something maybe we can talk about more. It's yeah. such yeah. a big deal that we forget about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I see it every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so just some data that I wanted to share with you. Um, we've talked about the Davenport Reads partnership in the past, so that's our partnership um, with um, Scott Community College with their Adult Learning um, Center at the Fairmont campus and um, with the Davenport Community Schools. So all the second grade students um, attending Davenport Community Schools through the Great, Great Minds program get a tour of one of our library facilities. So um, we always have the kids attend a tour um, at the um, the library location that's closest to um, to their school, so um, just for ease of access, because that's likely their neighborhood library. Um, so this past year, well, as part of the tours, um, we get a class list from the schools, and for any student that doesn't already have a library card, we issue them one of our find free cards. So as part of the tour, every kid gets a chance to check out a, an item from the library. Students that um, came back and then used that card um, to check out at least four more items, we, we pulled that data and we shared those names um, through our agreements with the schools back with them so that they could take a look and see what kind of impact that might have, just, just that minimal additional access um, to reading material. So district-wide, um, when they do their um, reading proficiency assessments, um, words per correct per minute in the spring of 1718 district wide was 50.3% um, were reaching proficiency with that. And then in the fall it was 51.4%. The students who, um, the second grade students who returned and used the library, um, they started out higher, and, um, but they gained more in proficiency um, from spring to fall. And we see the same thing with their, um, their A reading, which is another one of the assessments. So um, kids who didn't um, use the library district-wide 
lost proficiency in that measure over the summer um, were kids who were using the library um, gained in proficiency. Now we are certainly not saying that that is the only thing that had an effect, but we are saying that's one behavior that we can observe um, that seems to have an impact. So this was the first year we've done this. So, you know, one, one year and one small sample does not, you know, make, make a trend. Um, but I think the schools were um, gratified to see that, that impact mm -hmm. um, as well. I'm curious because you said that the students who did end up taking advantage of the program already seem to have some aptitudes mm -hmm. for love of reading. Um, are you considering um, additions to the program to maybe attract more of the non-traditional readers, you know, comic books or, you know, other ways yeah. to m make reading <coughs> more appealing to your not traditional readers? Yeah, you know, the, the juvenile graphic novels are really, they, they move a lot. They, yeah, <laughs> they're very, very popular <laughs> um, for sure. So. Um, what we're doing is um, this this spring, um, Ascentra Credit Union, they have, um, I'm not, I, can't, I don't know if you ever heard of their, their Booker Bear program that they do with the, um, through the Bettendorf um, Public Library and Schools, or Tiger Tales, which they do in Moline. Um, so they're starting a pilot project with us. The Downport um, School District was always kind of challenging to them because it's such a big district and they were like, oh, how do we do this for, you know, 2,000 second graders all at once? So um, we're starting with three schools that um, are around the west side of town, three elementary schools. And so when the kids come for their second grade tours this year, um, when they get back, um, we'll have reading logs for them and every kid that then reads 10 books as part of that will be invited um, back to the library um, on a Saturday for a free pizza party sponsored by Ascentra and they will receive a Cool Reader Penguin, best animal, um, to go <laughs> along with that. So um, we're hoping that that also um, encourages, encourages mm -hmm. um, kids to do that, and we'll be working with those particular elementary schools um, to see if we can bring some extra re reading materials into those classrooms That's during wonderful. that time period. And then again, um, talked about some of the studies showing that access to books um, equals increased educational attainment. Um, one of the big landmark studies that was done was done by the University of Nevada um, that showed that a student having or a child having a 500 book library or having university educated parents actually means that that child is more is likely to get an additional 2.4 years further in their education. So that's the difference between just getting a high school diploma and getting your AA or between getting your AA and getting your four year degree or dropping out when you're 16 and finishing high school education so that really has a significant impact but we know that a lot of our families in the community they're very they're housing insecure you know if you're moving every few months you're, you don't have a chance to build up a library for um, for your kids um, and you don't have the funds to, to purchase those materials um, so the library really is um, the place that folks can go to get that um, that access you also I'm, I know you have uh, materials about the imagination library. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest yeah. just aged out of it. <laughs> 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 but yeah, that's a great that's program. Right, yeah. I know, right? Any other questions? Actually, I don't have a question. I just I think we need to note too. We talked about a little bit earlier. You know, the library is an important part of our community, and not in just in a place to house books, which a lot of people have misnomer. But it was the warming center, and I <laughs> congratulate you and thank yeah. you and your staff because that's another part of the community, a place where people can stay warm during the weather. So that's something we ought to think about doing. Again, hopefully it won't be this cold, yeah. uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I thank you for that and your staff. And could you also t talk a little, you're also saying in the summer we put kids, and you mentioned, I remember when you talked about at Fairmont over the summer and the kids that were there all day, basically. Yeah, so our staff noticed that a couple years ago, that um, there were kids who were were there all day during the summer and they never noticed them leave for lunch um, so in uh, working with the schools um, um, that's now a summer meal site um, last year last summer we had about 50 kids every day um, coming in and, um, coming for lunch and you know using the computers and everything else um, the other really thing we interesting thing we noticed with that is that um, behavior problems with those kids absolutely dropped once we were able to provide them with a lunch. So that, that really had a, 
an impact um, on the whole experience, and you can just see the impact that you know being able to have a have a meal um, has on those kids. So. And you also got you. the vending. Um, machine type yes, thing. We finally got mint vending machines yeah. out there. <laughs> the, the, I know the cafe wasn't able to be sustainable, but um, I think that's really nice for patrons to, you know, if they're running to the library, they can also get a snack and that will hopefully also yeah. increase usage, which is hopefully all of our goals. Really nutritious, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> the satisfaction survey seemed to indicate that <clears throat> people were relatively satisfied with the hours mm -hmm. of operation. Is that, is that congruent with you know, I, I, I think we would always like to be open, you know, 9 to 8 in all three locations, Monday through Thursday. Um, but as we were looking at the strategic plan in these <coughs> community, um, we felt that we, we didn't have enough staff to, to increase the hours for that. Um, I still think it is something that, that folks are looking for, but, but um, the outreach seemed like it was a way to increase the impact in the community as well. But I think as long as we don't open until noon, some days of the week at the branches, we're always going to have people there at 10 o'clock, you know, peering in the door. Um, <laughs> so um, it certainly would be um, something that would be nice to have. And, you know, you, you ended your talk with mobility issues and, mm -hmm. and uh, outreach is what you're calling what we're doing. And I know one of the primary issues that the schools have in terms of attendance and trying to do a good job with the kids is this issue of mobility that we have in an urban community where parents are moving from place to place mm -hmm. to try to stay ahead of the landlords and, and keep up with rent. Um, and so the schools now have a, a fidelity across the system with all the schools doing the same thing at the same time, which helps. But I think what you're doing, you know, again, to try to reach out to the kids to be where they are, I, I think that's something that is very important. Isn't there, uh, doesn't the school district has a program where kids can ride city bus for we, free? We have mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we have that, that program. Mm -hmm. and that must help. Well, I, I, think it, I think it does and it doesn't because a lot of these kids are, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. Um, their parents are not available to bring them on the bus. Um, so I don't know that they're wanting to send them off um, on their own doing that so I think that that's part of it and if you're bringing you know if you've got a toddler you know that when you check out picture books you're you're t checking out 20 items to keep them busy because <laughs> they go through them so much and that's a lot to to haul while you're hauling your kid on the bus and I, I just think it's I think it's just difficult yeah. on paper it looks like a really good yeah. program yeah. I can see there's some problems yeah. with logistics yeah. I, you know I think for some of the older kids it's Certainly um, increases that accessibility for that younger age group. I think it's, I think it's still pretty, pretty challenging for folks. Great. Any other questions? Thank you, Amy, mm -hmm. very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think we're moving on. Mr. Oswald. COVID forces. Rich. So I know Rich will cover some of this in his presentation, but it's probably about a year and a half ago we asked you to take a little bit of a leap of faith and codify a new department for the first time and probably a really, really long time uh, because as I started with the city and then merged through the roles I've held, the one area where I interacted with all of you very, very consistently was this one. Uh, and so we as a team brainstormed how, how can we do this different, how can we do it better. Uh, and so the idea of actually bringing on a department head who has better access to you, a little more authority in the community and within the organization is the proposal we brought forward. Uh, Rich joined our team in May of 17 um, and so you're really looking at our first full fiscal year of what they've done um, and I know I can probably speak on Nicole's behalf we are grateful for rich every day <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right so neighborhood services or as most of us know it's basically code city code enforcement um, just a general overview and I know most of you guys know this is sort of rehashing it for you but we do everything from from debris which would be trash cars trees water issues, uh, zoning, um, weeds and vegetation, snow, we get involved in parking, and then obviously we take care of our city-owned lots and sidewalks as far as snow removal and stuff like that. And then we do 
Davao and Parking Enforcement downtown. So we sort of keep an overall very busy schedule and, and a lot of things, but we see to get through them all. And then part of what I've been trying to do is get us more ward focused, get our inspectors sort of more focused on the overall picture of code enforcement, not just rental inspections are not just debris inspection. So sort of they have an ownership to look at it all and make sure they're addressing everything we can um, in a timely manner. So if you look at our sort of our overall nuisance numbers, so this is taking in uh, everything that, this is not vehicles, rentals, or, or lawn inspections. This is sort of that all other category. So debris, garbage, and stuff like that. If you look, sort of the main number, if you look in fiscal year 17, we had some retirements, sort of where I came in mid-year, and we started making some small changes there. And then fiscal year 18 is our first full year of, of sort of changing things up, standalone department, getting our people focused on, here's your ward assignment, this is your area to focus on. Prior to that, they were sort of scattered across the city. So they might be in two or three wards. Um, you know, some wards are a little bit busier than other wards. It just depends on, on the time. Some, some of it's time of year, some of it's the amount of rental properties. It, it, it fluctuates each time, but we had a great, so as far as the, the lighter colored blue is our citizen complaint, so this is actually citizens calling into Public Works asking for us to come out and inspect something. Um, if you look at 18, we had about 1,700 citizen complaints compared to our staff going out, and what I preach every day is proactive. So if you're going out to look at something, you should be looking, you know, both sides of the street, both sides of the alley, making sure we're addressing everything. So our staff generated about 8,400 different nuisance aspects that they looked into. So we're basically a five to one ratio of what we're getting from the public and then what we're going out and doing ourselves. And I think that's the key. I mean, how many times they, you know, in the past they'd go out and address something. And, and let's be honest, sometimes the complainer was almost as bad as the person they were going out to address. Or they had other properties that the neighbors were afraid to call on. They didn't want to call on them. And if we weren't addressing them, they were never going to get fixed. So we really pushed that. These are your wards, take ownership in it. You know, treat it as your neighborhood. You're driving down that street. Just put yourself there because we, you know, the common thing we hear all the time is, would you like to live by this? And I think, you know, I, I am proud, you know, I can say, you know what, I live in Davenport. I understand what you're saying. I don't live outside of the city and the majority of my code enforcement officers live in Davenport. So it's sort of nice. They have that ownership of, yep, this is our town too. And we try to make sure the citizens understand. We understand what you're looking at and we're going to try to fix it for you. Um, so vehicle inspections, this is something I want to put in here because we've been asked to sort of uptick our, our vehicle inspections on properties, our nuisance vehicles. Um, so in fiscal year 18, part of this is citizen complaints. A lot of this is self-driven by our staff. We addressed a little over 1,300 vehicle complaints in 18. That number, we sort of stepped it up near the end of fiscal year 18. We've been handling a lot of them, but of the 1,300 we did, we did about uh, a little over 300 toes are removals from properties. The rest were, were owner occupied. We had some larger outlying toes that I didn't include in this number because they were large properties and, and large issues. But this is just your general old car has been sitting in the backyard for 20 years and nothing was going to be done with it. Or in some cases, <laughs> some people didn't even know who owned the car. It had just been sitting there for so long. So um, something you guys asked is address. We've been addressing better. Um, we work with. Uh, the police department on this a lot, making sure we're following all the proper procedures as far as towing and when we need assistance or that and trying to balance that on street, off street issue with the police department, which, which has worked out very good. So I think we've seen better, we're getting better at it, getting better at addressing the vehicle issues. Uh, nuisance lawn inspection, so this is going out, getting called on, on grass. So as you see, as a standalone department, we started addressing more. This is more of just not going out to the complaints, but taking that ownership. And if I'm gonna go ahead and abate this property, and there's three more within the area, I'm gonna address those as a code enforcement officer. I'm not gonna wait for that phone call. Um, of the 3,500 we went to, about 1,000 of them owner complied. So basically that means that the owner, once we addressed it or, you know, they went ahead and took care of it, or they saw it was on their property and then got out and mowed it right away. So we are seeing a little bit better compliance with that. Um, and then we'll talk, Rental inspections, we've had some of our bigger changes in our rental inspection. Um, just an overview of where we are. This number hasn't really fluctuated. I think when I talked to you guys back with our rental ordinance, we're still about over 7,000 rental properties in Davenport. Um, the big number is we have 28 different owners of those properties. So, you know, we're dealing with a lot of different owners. The nice part is a lot of those owners have hired property management companies, which are about 43. Um, one thing we've really cleaned up is our is our database of owners and managers. So, you know, we have our system Cartograph now. We have 
made sure we've tried to get a phone number with every property, tried to get you know a manager of record for where we know who to call. A lot of times when you guys call us on a property, instead of driving out there now, it's a quick phone call, letting that property manager know, hey, you guys need to address this. We don't, you know, we're gonna come out today, but just giving you a heads up or uh, making sure our rental licenses are up to date, just that contact information. And one of our things we passed was having that owner of record on file, and we've really been pushing that and trying to get that information cleaned up. So uh, Hillary Bells is our clerk, does a great job communicating with the landlords and getting that information. Uh, rental inspections, so you see it in fiscal year 18, we made a, a pretty good jump. Now part of this is a lot of our large complexes sort of hit that year, but we also got caught up. So I think every ward was about three years behind. Um, currently we are up to date except in three and four, and they're just a little under a year behind, but we're, we're getting ca caught up on those. It's sort of our higher population of rentals, but Prior to that, in you know, fiscal year 17, we were looking about three years behind in every ward. So we've really got caught back up and uh, addressing some pretty big issues on some of those rental properties that were just left standalone for a while. So Well, that's really important to residents because Absolutely. some of those were safety and health violations. Safety, health violations, a lot of them had, since their last inspection, had two different owners in the interim. So. You know, they had different people sort of fluctuating of who really, you know, a lot of people didn't even know who their landlord was sometimes. Yeah. And that's a sort that's of amazing fact in the year. Right? Really Check important for our renters. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it is getting our landlords just to understand what the inspection program is. You know, and that we're, we're really there to help you. We want to make sure we're addressing life safety issues. If you're willing to work with us, we're willing to work with you to get these things fixed and get your properties back up to date. Um, some of our changes, um, we adopted the uh, International Property Maintenance Code, which is sort of a cleaner cut version of what we had in our city ordinance, but it's easier for not only the citizen, landlord, but the general public just to look at and say, what are they going in these properties I'm looking at? What, what is meaningful to me as a landlord when I need to inspect it? And it's a little bit easier code to read. There's not so much gray area in that code. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we started looking at more of the relocation of, of rental license. Um, Right now, we've used that as a good tool, saying, no, listen, we will do this. You need to get in compliance. Um, it's been working. The biggest thing we've been doing is our nuisance property declarations. So it's sort of a rolling average. So if you're declared a nuisance property, basically what that means is we no longer have to provide notice. We can go on the property, do cleanups, do whatever we need. There's no longer a, a letter notice or anything. Um, currently, as of the other day, we have 74 properties that are nuisance properties. Now that fluctuates, right? So every year you can fall off. If you've done what you're supposed to do, you fall off. Because we're tackling it harder, we're seeing more properties fall off that. So, you know, they're getting they're getting their act together, upsizing dumpsters, up getting the right number of garbage cans, um, shutting down units. You know, we've had some properties that long term tenants or landlords that weren't doing anything now those properties unfortunately are sitting vacant, but at least they're not occupied anymore, right? They're no longer rental properties. So and hopefully they'll switch hands and somebody else will get in there and fix them up. So we're seeing better with pushing the nuisance declaration. And just remember there's two nuisance, there's a police nuisance and then a, an NSD nuisance. So the police nuisance follows more of the criminal activity and the immediate eviction where we're more about the cleanliness, tightness, and, and structure of the building, so. How many of those are rental, these are, are these residential? Yep, so 74 properties, about 50 of them are rental. Okay, and the other are owner-occupied? Are owner-occupied, yep. Two -thirds. Yep. So, and that is the thing. We also, you know, where we are, I think sometimes the department got a little focused on rental only. We focus on the city as a whole. So we don't look if it's rental or owner occupied at first. We look at the property as a whole and then dive into the facts after that. So, uh, demolition program, um, something always has been a pretty good program moving forward and, and trying to identify property. Um, obviously, the goal is to enhance neighborhoods, make sure that our neighborhood, we can keep our neighborhoods <laughs> growing. Um, Tracking vacant properties, that's something we've, we've passed as a new ordinance that we're gonna be working on in this upcoming fiscal year to get that rolled out in a better plan. And then um, also creating that list, keeping track of, okay, which properties are on that list. And then where we've gotten better, and we'll talk about a little better, is working with CPED and saying, hey, here's some properties, you got an investor, here's something that can be saved, right? Let's get it saved, let's just not keep it on our list. And then the other thing by tracking these properties, we're getting them boarded up and secured so they're not getting vandalized, they're not you're trying to keep the weather out of them, so they're not just sitting there deteriorating. Um, just a brief demo map of sort of where we've been. Uh, the red ones are what we're currently doing, the blue is what's been done in the past. So um, 
we sort of been all over, all over, you know, east to west, um, getting a little bit north, but um, we have a pretty good spread. We try to address the bigger issues. And sort of when my staff looks at it, obviously safety is number one, and then basically location is a big factor too. You know, if it's on the corner of Locust and Brady, do you really want a dilapidated building right there? You know, so we try to we try to focus that. We don't we want people coming to town not seeing a fallen down structure. So we really try to rate them on that on that key, and we have a whole staff rating system. So it's we bring four of our staff together, and we rate the properties before we put them on our demo list. That way, it's a sort of a feedback type thing, just not one person making that decision on where it should be. Uh, process improvements for the department, some things we've lo really looked at. Staff development is a big one. So um, International Code Council training for all of my staff. Um, I had a couple of really good senior staff members that were doing things right, so now we got everybody shadowing them, sort of following their lead, following the documentation piece of it, um, and getting everybody doing the same thing. So everybody, when they're addressing a property, everybody's going to address it the same way. There's not going to be, well, Joe is going to do it this way and Bob's going to do it that way. It's, it's no, it's done the same way. And, and that was a big piece of feedback I heard from everybody. Well, if so-and-so comes to my property, they don't care about this, but this guy comes over and, and they're hammering me. Well, now we are equally enforcing, properly enforcing, and it's done the same across the board. Um, I do monthly one-on-one -on -one reviews with my staff, so just not the big staff meeting, I'm bringing them in. Um, they're, they were all at a different level of enforcement. So some of those meetings are more encouraging. Some of those are, hey, let's sharpen our tools on this. Let's make sure we're notating and cartograph. Um, really, a lot of times, if you guys call Tiffany, I don't want to have a call from Tiffany asking what's the status on a property. I want to make sure my inspectors are keeping those notes up to date and cartograph for you guys to have a quick answer. We're still working on that. It's still uh, that whole note ta taking part is something we're, we're working on, but it's getting better. It is getting better. Um, we sort of talked about doing everything the same with the uniform inspections that, you know, just keeping everything the same. I think ward assignments were the big things. Like I said, we were scattered around. Now we're, they have a ward assignment. So they're there every day. That's their ward. They're not in three and then in five, then in six and then seven. So they're starting to see, they're getting to know the landlords, getting to know the neighbors, getting to know people. And we've seen a big difference of they've driven past this person who's out in their yard every day and that person's never waved them down or talked to them. And now they're like, oh, what's your name? I see you around here all the time. So we're getting more of that community building, community relationships, which is really, really good. And then the big thing for me is, is department relationships. Obviously, there was always some, some play with the departments, but now there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversations like, here's our problem. How can you help us? How can we help you? So with legal, the fire department, and the police department, you know, we, I probably talk to those, somebody from those department every day. Our staff is talking to somebody in those departments every day along with CPED and everybody. So there's a lot more in and out information coming out of our department. We're just, you know, we're a standalone department now, but we're better uh, communicating with the city. And then, any questions? <laughs> hey, Rich, uh, yeah. congratulations on a great first year. <coughs> Looking forward to uh, what happens next year. There's plenty of nuisance properties around to keep your crew busy. I, I want to apologize for save our core neighborhoods and <coughs> the department is so vital to that success. So, Thank great you. first year, keep it up. Thank you. All right. And, and Judy, uh, good job on the first year, good job you know, getting this focus because it's a lot of us been fo asking you to focus it or you or whoever to focus it and you have and so that's a great thing and good job Rich because we, we, we get after you and you're at this area a lot. Yeah. Um, but the way I look at it, someone comes what do they see and we can debate that forever but what do you see right and it, and an old question and it still comes up periodically people will say well you're always next to something well we're getting rid of the something or we're working on the something and we'll make the damn book overall better and that's a credit to everybody here and a credit to you guys and the staff for doing that because our visual uh, thing of Davenport is improving and, and, and you are an effort and the last thing I'll say is keep going hard don't ever think, at least from my perspective, that, well, should I or should I? Deal with it and go hard and, and to make the optic of Davenport better. Thank you for your, doing your work. And I wanted to commend your customer service focus. You know, I've never had to call back and say, oh, so-and-so didn't hear from neighborhood services. 
Um, you know, you're always very good about following up uh, and, and doing that. And I think that the citizens really appreciate that. Um, so please keep doing that. Yeah. I think a big part of that is, is my staff. They've really embraced that <laughs> customer service. You know, I, I, I really appreciate that. You know, no matter where you're going, they're your customers. You treat them as such. And, and they're going to give you a review, right? They're going to, I mean, trust me, they'll call the mayor. They'll call you guys <laughs> if we're not, if we're not, you know, above par. But I think it, it's growing for us. I think I shared with some of you guys, it's, um, we had some easy wins in the beginning, and now we're, we're learning that process on the more difficult ones and making sure we have all our tools in the toolbox. And I mean, we couldn't be as successful if we didn't have legal and the PD and fire and sort of having that general knowledge all together to, to help us be successful. So, and your guys' support has helped a lot, so it makes it a lot easier. So. I, I'd like to, uh, I do have a couple things I'd like to add. Um, and thank you, Rick. You, I mean, you and I. Corey knows <laughs> we you know there's lots of things going back and forth and part of uh, you know part of understanding this is I, I feel like when I go back to people and residents I need to understand why there seems that there still are disconnects in within the process not within the people doing it but within the process um, and you know there are a couple of things that you know that I've talked about via most mostly via email which at least I look at them because then Tiffany gets the copy uh, but, you know, one of the issues I, I still see is um, issues surrounding nuisance vehicles, uh, which are just, you know, you, ha you can have nuisance properties, but nuis nuisance vehicles parked on streets. Um, and because we now have a way of dealing with, with vehicles that are sort of parked in on private property that they're not properly parked. We can tell them after 24 hours, right? But the ones on the street, we have to go through, through this sort of elaborate dance. The ones that are unlicensed, we have to go through an elaborate dance, and part of that's, we think, concerns about state law. Um, so um, it, it, then that goes to the police department. So the ones parked on the street go to the police department. So explaining that to a resident, and this gets stickered and it gets seven days or whatever, it's, it's very, it is, it, we've made it better in one way, but it's also confusing. Um, I had talked to Corey and to Rich, and Corey is mostly about the, um, the state law, but my question was, why are we allowing unlicensed vehicles to park on city streets? Because you technically can't drive an unlicensed, if a vehicle doesn't have a tag, you really can't drive it, right? It, I'm not talking about where they've been sold and there's a sticker on the back. And that, so that small subset, the only thing would be, well, if someone say, Rich, you bought a car from me, and you privately, and you don't have a tag, and you don't have it for 30 days. So there's some question about state law requiring that to be allowed to be on the street because you have 30 days to get your tag, and you don't have a dealer sticker. Mm -hmm. But, in fact, you can't drive that car. So it's sort of, if it's parked on the street, you can't move it every 20, you technically can't move it because it doesn't have license right so but we can't tag that so we can't remove that very easily from the street and it I can't tell you and I'm sure you've all experienced this too but at least in you know where in, in the third ward it's a huge problem because in fact these cars are not waiting for a new tag they just you know somebody parks them on the street and when the police when the traffic comes and puts a sticker on them they just move them across the street um, and it just, it makes, you know, low-income residents just crazy. Um, and explaining it's pretty uh, challenging, too, sometimes. Um, and I do try to do that. And I would just, in this area, if this would be so huge if, we were, if there's some way we could work our way through to address it in a better way. To, to say to one, well, the police deal with this, but over here, the, our, our public works, you know, to citizens who don't maybe understand the structure, um, but that would go a very long way because it is an enormous issue. And I'll be turning in a lot over the next week, but they're parked on the streets. So I guess the police will deal with them that, you know, clearly were not moved through any of the studies that we had. Well, that's so still, <laughs> that piece is still rich, Atlanta. Yeah. So the, so the snow yeah. parking is still neighborhood uh, services. Even, if, even so. if it's after the nuisance, after the snow emergency is over. Yeah, because so we, then if they okay. haven't been moved in 24 hours and given the amount of snow we've had, it's exactly. pretty easy to tell who's moved and who hasn't. That's right. and because I'll be we did a big... You know, I'll be Monday we should see a latte. 
I mean, there's a, lot of, cars, a lot of cars. There's a lot like of cars that. looking like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. This, is <laughs> yeah. So, this was yeah. a timely picture. I mean, I, I, I mean I, and I do want to commend uh, uh, Rich's, Rich and, and his department because, I mean, we've dealt with some very thorny things and gotten some thorny things resolved so quickly, some taking longer. But this is something that we still could refine, and I wish there were some way. It's only his first year. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a problem. It may be a problem with state law as well, but interpretation of this thing about, you know, you have to. I think, you know. I think we, Rich, is there is there confusion here from your perspective? No, I think do? so. I think that's one thing. There was a very fine line in the past, and we in part of those relationship building things, we've been working with the traffic department with with Davenport Police, and so we understand now if we're going to the property address one thing, we will we will start enforcing on the street too. Right. It's just that fine line trying to blend those two together and make sure it's it, we're doing everything right. There's different laws you have to fire up, file if it's on the street, if it's on the private property. So we're trying to iron those things out. And I think that is something definitely, I know a, a few of you guys that's that's near and dear to your heart are these vehicles and we're trying to find that solution. And, it's not near and dear and, to my and heart. We'll, we'll continue, so to we will continue to work on ironing that out, so. Yeah. Well, and, uh, and I know people appreciate what you do and I've gotten that feedback. Also wanted to say, uh, thank you so much for, uh, you know, downtown is sort of an area that is a neighborhood. Um, uh, you know, the voice that kind of speaks for downtown sometimes is the downtown partnership. And I, um, I want to commend both uh, Rich and Nicole for, I think, a closer relationship this year and talking over issues and trying to uh, partner together. There's been a lot of that going on. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Um, but I really appreciate that as well on both Nicole's part and also Rich's part. So I think that's a better relationship mm -hmm. and I think that's going to pay off down the road. So, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, for all the, the senior members here, this is a new program, but for Teresa and I, this is, uh, this is our base on. I mean, we've always had this. And I can't imagine what it would have been like without it. I mean, I don't know how many if you were to rate wards in terms of number of calls, I mean, I'm, I'm up there with stuff. But I, I don't know if I'm in a good mood today or what. Maybe this session has made me in a better mood, but I'm thinking of stuff. I'm thinking yesterday, and I hope I don't get guys in trouble, but there were a couple of uh, drivers. Uh, there's a grader driver who saw a guy stuck in a ditch. He got out of his grader after he finished his job. Snow plow type, but guy comes by. They get out and push this guy out of the ditch. The, uh, the outreach program that Amy's doing, and, and, and there have been issues that I've had with neighborhood services where there hasn't been a code issue, but there's a relationship issue, and the department, <coughs> you guys deal with that. Uh, and I think part of that is having people specifically tied to those wards and those relationships. Um, we've done mediation, which you didn't mention, uh, Rich no. pulled together mediation. We spent hours with people in mediation. This is this is stuff that maybe is, is no longer above and beyond. It is part of what we do now in Davenport, and it just makes me pleased to know that we're not doing stuff by the book. We're not. I know that you have a, a, a characteristic of, of not uh, hammering people, but trying to work with them in a way that, in the long term, is much more productive than you know, you're fine. Uh, so I'm, I'm just real pleased with the direction of the programs you're going. Neighborhood services, I think, is, is doing an excellent job because this is a quality of life program that you're doing. It's so important to people. The dollars and cents might not show up, you know, in what we're looking at in terms of budget, but it's very important to the people of Davenport, and I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. Rich, I, I want to say you're doing a great job. Things have changed a lot, but dealing with these nuisance Right. that I deal with on a daily basis. We've been dealing with them for the last three years, and we just seem to can't do anything about them. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I get the phone calls every day. Yeah. And, and part of the part of that is what we're trying to do as a department is some of those, and a couple of your properties, were long-term issues, and the amount of stuff that needs to be done to get those cleaned up, the time factor, is, you know, we're, what is that logical approach to say, do this right, get it cleaned up, and then it's no longer a, a, a problem. And some of that, I know a couple of the properties are uh, were staff changes, getting the right staff in place. So I would like to see every, you know, as many solved, you know, within 30 days as we can. 
So unfortunately, right now we just have some that are taking a lot longer. And we'll, once we get those cleaned up, I think it'll be more fluid yeah, know, and a quick, quicker time frame. One property where we did it for a long time, mm -hmm. still wants to have a jump Well, it's and we're in litigation on some of those, and so we have to go through the due process of the court exactly. system. Well, court system. Dumping tires, you know, you go down Concord Street, Utah, West Concord, you know the yeah. <coughs> It just seems like more people are dumping stuff. How do we so, on some of the illegal dumping stuff, we, if we can find, I mean, believe it or not, people illegally dump their bills and statements. So, if we can, <laughs> if we can go ahead and get that information, we do we do track those people down, and we've been issuing civil citations and clean up stuff. Unfortunately, some of it we can't we can't catch. Uh, we try to educate property owners, you know, simple steps they can do to not make their property so, so alluring to legal dumping. But that is a big problem. I mean, I agree with you. It's a, it's a huge problem. Um, but we do try to invest, you know, find out who did the dumping and then try to address it at that. So it's something that maybe in the past wasn't done as, as much as we're doing now. But yeah, our guys dig through the garbage when they get called out there and try to find bills and statements or any type of information they can. And then they'll go back. I think we caught a guy that had been dumping on Credit Island for a while, and uh, we actually, he left a, a statement down there one time, so we were able to figure that out. So we knew what type of car he drove, and then we were able to figure that out, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. one of the reasons why we, on the solid waste side, we keep that, yeah. uh, that bulky pickup be so low. Several times we've discussed right. the idea of raising it, and we're like, no, the, it, consequence. it, the consequences awesome. are too much, you know, with that one, so leave it where it is. It, it's a great value for people who take advantage of it. That's so. another one of the things. How do you, you know, what are you going to do? Well, we've if talked somebody about... somebody fills up the truck and backs up and dumps it. Trail cameras and yep. kind of different defensive strategies where at least we can start to gather intelligence because most of this happens in the middle of the night right. when right. Right. Um, good yeah. citizens are home. What's the maximum fine you could enforce? Uh, I think it's 200 right now. I mean, if you don't... That's top. I mean, that's the cleanup fee plus a fine if you find can we make it higher? Sure, we can look at it. I mean, if you don't have a moral objection to illegal dumping, like some people might not have a moral objection to hitting somebody in the face, right. you have to make the penalty worse than your sure. desire we'll to do so. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's good. I like that. <laughs> you have some. I was just going to say, just a quick tag on real quick. On, on the safety, on nuisance, if you can go deal with it and you can go on there without saying, have at it. I mean, right. these things are taking forever. Go put it in, put it on those bills, put a lien on it, whatever. Um, I agree, but some in the past, and you're doing better, but I agree. The pattern ones, the constant ones, no, the, your task force handles that. Because right. yeah. they're not doing it. So yep. go clean it, put a bill, put a lien, deal with that. Because we, we can't wait for a long time to clean yeah, it. And that's where those department relationships have been valuable now that we have grown those. Now we know, okay, this is exactly what we can do. This is where we're within our lines, and we're sometimes where we have to break, right? But we're getting better at that, so. several times half joking half serious which are so scary <laughs> um, it's just a job that we know that people don't call you to say hey this looks great thank you um, so thank you for hanging in there we really appreciate it and I, I have noticed I have received feedback positive um, that cars have been moved neighborhoods are looking better so thank you Corey as we get towards spring maybe we should uh, sit down with Rich and just uh, review everything Come spring, you know, the door is going to be open, the snow will be gone, and we'll be dealing with some real challenges. And we have to be, especially with spring, we got to get very aggressive just to clean up what was left in the winter. Luckily for Rich, we sit down multiple times a week. <laughs> I know. <laughs> is there a like we have a we have a sort of a problem properties list? Is there a problem properties list for? It's in Cartograph. Yeah, it's all in. It's in Cartograph, or you know, the staff that's assigned that ward keeps their their not daily drivers. Not Cartograph, but private, but city Cartograph. I mean, I've been on Cartograph, but I've not seen. I don't well, like a list. Much. Does we have the back no, end, yeah. right? Yeah. It's the exactly. back end. We don't have a what is list. No, <laughs> we don't have a top ten list. <laughs> 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 Great. Any other questions for Rich? No. Good job. Rich. Thank you very Thank much. You. We're going to take a little break and then we'll get into the work plan. All right. Coffee break with the bathroom.
Transition into our work plan from our city administrator <laughs> and our goals and how they match up. So, on that, I'm going to turn it over to Corey Spiegel, our city administrator. Well, encourage Alderman Dunn, Dunn to join the party. <laughs> so, before we get rolling into this, uh, I just want to take a moment and recognize staff. This work plan doesn't happen without the individuals who sit quietly back there. Every Wednesday night, um, but are just a fantastic group of people, and I couldn't be more proud of the team we have in place right now. Uh, and I think you'll see that when we talk about what we accomplished in 2018 uh, and some of the goals that are ahead of us. So a few years ago, probably this is probably two budgets ago, we talked about focus, and we, as a leadership team, developed the mission statement. Why, why are we here? What are we doing? As you saw in the operating budget, 80% of our investment is in our human capital. Uh, so we need to make sure we're attracting the right people, we're keeping talent strong, um, because our organization is an organization of people. Uh, Rich and Amy both being here talking about their departments, you heard a strong theme of cross-departmental collaboration. Um, every department has a primary service area, but that area only gets enhanced by uh, using all of the resources we have available as an organization. Uh, we're innovating how we share information. I'll talk much more about that at the end, because that's one of our strategic initiatives for 2019. Um, we're financially prudent. This was a particularly easy, easy budget for those of you who've been around for, for a few of these. Um, but we're in the best financial position we've been in in probably a decade. Uh, and that's council's leadership, that's Brandon being Brandon, um, and the team just being really, really prudent with how we spend our money and, and what we're accomplishing with it. Uh, and you'll see as we talk through the work plan, we, we gave you goals that we wanted to accomplish and we are doing just that. Everything we do as an organization ties back to six operational pillars. Uh, you see this as part of your goal setting process. Um, but if, if it can't be tied back to one of these six things, we as a city shouldn't be doing it. Uh, there's there's no, no rocket science behind any of these. Uh, these are very important things for local government to be doing. Um, but everything we do in our goals and our work plans that are set up for staff ties back to these six pillars. So as you will recall, about 15 months ago, uh, when the, the new council was elected, not fully seated yet, we actually started the goal setting process in November. And, and again, we appreciate your continuous feedback into this. 
Uh, so we allow you to say, here are our goals, and we kind of put it into a system, and, and then you prioritize and, and continue to prioritize. And this particular council came up with six very strategic goals. And so the work plan really focuses on these. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about crime reduction in, in our juvenile system that we're, we're having challenges and opportunities with. Uh, commercial corridor revitalization is a huge piece, and, and that and urban revitalization, I would say, are about as married at the hip as you can get. Uh, the commercial corridors really beget the neighborhoods and vice versa. Uh, Main Street Landing and infrastructure, big areas. In this budget is built on infrastructure in many ways. Uh, and then one of the, the last goals you had was long-term community funding plan for the Figgy and the Putnam. And, and that was a big moment we'll celebrate here in a minute. So well-protected community, first of the pillars. Uh, the mayor, along with Chief Skorsky and Sarah and, and many others, spent countless hours on this topic. Uh, and I think have, have done a lot of great due diligence and have positioned it into a place where the, the right organization is taking leadership. We are still very much a part of this, uh, but the city isn't necessarily the driver on this topic. Uh, we're, we're very much the, the sidecar on this one, and, and so staff will remain dedicated <coughs> to this going into 19, uh, but we accomplished a tremendous amount with our partnership with DOJ and OJJP this year. Um, and I think that's a great foundation from which we can work. Uh, PD got their CALEA accreditation again, uh, so I'm sure Jane is incredibly happy to be to be done with us for a couple years. Um, but the police department continues to be one of the best in the nation, and we're we're, we're very proud of them. Fire uh, has changed a lot, and I can't uh, thank Chief Carlson enough. He's been fantastic to work with, but he has has some new comrades. We said goodbye to Chief Bickford on Thursday. Um, and so Chief McDougall has now taken over that role. Uh, he has a fantastic team in place, and so the department is really in a great place to take us forward. And we've got some really big initiatives ahead that we'll be working with FIRE on. One of them that I think Chief Carlson and Chief Bickford and many others worked <coughs> on was priority dispatch. So that was direction from the SEC board, of which we are a part, uh, to really evaluate, do we need to send an ambulance and a fire truck hot on every single call uh, regardless of the call. And so a, a large consortium of fire professionals, medic, the medical professionals, the hospitals, uh, and SEC worked through, I don't know, Chief, a year probably of evaluating 1,700 different call types and, and when do we go at what speed for which call and who goes. Um, I think it's a year into implementation. It's been doing great. Um, and they continue to refine it. And we hear about that at the SEC board. So you'll, you'll see the check mark on that one. That means it probably won't come back. Um, it is operationalized at this point. You know, fire and PD continue to work with second medic to make sure we're on point with the calls we're responding to. Um, but it's no longer a goal. It's now officially operationalized. Corey, if I could make one quick comment. Sure. And thanks for that notice about the blue, the Rubin panel. But also that's the same thing with the, um, the sessions we've been doing on the juvenile justice. What's moving to more an institutional, community-wide direction, um, and we're going to hear more about that over the next year. So I think it's a matter of we can take a lead in getting things underway or be part of that leadership, but then we need the whole community to make it come together. So. Um, one of the other areas in well-protected community that we've really focused on the last year or so is, is staying equipped. Uh, you know, talk to many of you about the importance of making sure the fire trucks are replaced on a normal schedule. We've got two engines on order, a truck on order. Uh, we were very successful with the federal grant and the SEAs, uh, so that's great for fire. You saw in the CIP, we're replacing police vehicles and NIBIN and getting the, the LPR systems in place, uh, making sure that our public safety providers have the best tools and that it's not just one and done and we forget, but that we're continuing to sustain our fleet and our tools over time. Uh, so that will be ongoing. What about our uh, fire training center? Can you speak briefly on that? I can when we get to 19 goals. Great minds. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just fire truck because you do a great job of providing, but they do a great job of maintaining mm -hmm. the stuff on their own so we don't have to outsource they do that, and that's a great thing yep. for us. Yep. Maybe a, a 
definitely a very talented group of individuals. Um, one of the most important parts of well-protected community is that community engagement. You're, you're hearing that theme from all of our departments, um, but being very accessible in the community um, and training. We need to make sure our, our personnel are ready to provide the services when people need them. Uh, so we, we invest a lot of time in training in both departments. That's very important. Uh, so those are the two key areas that those departments continue to get better at, and, and I'm really proud of them. So that is generally public safety. We'll move on to fiscal vitality. Uh, we've talked a lot about planning for our next economic development uh, business park. We've generally identified the sites, uh, the property owners. We've met with them. They generally know this is our plan. We, we have a good master plan. It's now a matter of implementing it. We need to get sewer out there. There's no urgency. I think identifying the opportunity is good, and as opportunities come along, then we can build the implementation plan out. Yeah, so I just, you just said uh, there's no urgency, and I wanted to, to say that we still have land up at the mm -hmm. Denial Industrial Park uh, that the GDRC is over. There's still some room to expand up there, so we have plenty of place to attract the, these newer mm -hmm. businesses and retain businesses in that park while we work on this. And then the GDRC has discussed that you know, if the city wants uh, that same model and the same group um, on this land, that that is something that the, the, that group would be interested in doing. And this is one of those long range goals that I don't want any of us to lose sight of it today, but there's, there's gonna be no instant gratification with this project. This is one that the people sitting at this table 20 years from now are gonna be like, thankfully they did that back then. And that's the goal of this, that we keep moving it incrementally so that when the day comes, when you know the Eastern Iowa Industrial Complex is built out uh, or we have a mega user come in, that we're ready to, to make those you projects up, happen. You bring up a really good point because a lot of people thought Trapped and Sterilite was an overnight success and it was a 20-year project. So uh, that's the same thing here. This will mm -hmm. be our next 20-year project. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing that up. And when they're built at this scale, you, you need 20 years yeah. to make them happen. So we talked uh, commercial corridors as a council goal, and so I forgot to mention, Brandon, we don't need the little star CG means. If it's in the work plan, it ties back to a council goal. That's what that little denotation is. Um, but the, the intersection of Kimberly and Brady is, is at a really interesting place in, in history. Uh, the, the mega mall as it was built in the 70s and 80s is, is becoming a relic. Um, you can see this is very much a concrete jungle. Uh, there is a whole lot of concrete down, and, and that's just not the real estate development of the future. Uh, fortunately, over the past year, we worked very closely with Denise Rich, who's the property owner of the mall, um, on repositioning the asset. You know, what, what pieces of the big, big boxes stay? What types of land uses and development can we introduce to make this the community center that the mall once was? Um, you know, we've lost two boxes, but we've gained H&M. It's a really interesting market that you have these great investments. And at the same time, you, you lose Toys R Us and Sears and, and Yonkers and you figure how much of this is reusable or should be reusable and, and what kinds of things do we want to do. Uh, CPED staff and, and Sarah and I have been working with Mace Rich and will continue to do that. Um, and I would see more activity around this area as well because we are very much at the tipping point on this property and, and we don't want to lose it. Are there any restrictions on this property or is there any, um, there's no ground fields, is there no, I mean, they'll have their self-generated covenant. So the big boxes were fairly notorious back in the day about you can only have one of this type of merchant. And nobody could have figured out where retail was today when they did those deals. Um, so a lot of that is just the, the mental repositioning of retailers of do I really want to be seen by the road or do, we, do I want to be surrounded by activity? And, and that's the era we're in with, with the market right now. Are those covenants? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just curious if those covenants are modifiable if, if we and the... Original. So they're not our covenants. Oh, uh, we okay. handle the zoning. This was all a private transaction where Sears would say, you can't block my visibility from this angle and that angle and that angle. So it's really between the mall owner and its tenants. Gotcha. Um, so it's very much a private transaction, I think, where we've talked as staff, and, and I know Alderman Matson, you and I have started to talk about this a little bit. Um, what we expected a mall to be and what we envisioned this area of town to be in the future are two very different things. Uh, and that's good. What I was gonna say. This is the decision of the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my opinion. 
this, what we're going to do is this, and what out of the box thinking, and I know you're leading that, and that's a great thing, and you had discussions, but, but I'm all support. This, this is the discussion. Where, where do we go? How are we going to do that? And it's got to be outside the box, not the regular stuff. So yeah, we, we, we have to break the model a little bit yeah, on this one, and, that, and that's okay. And uh, I realize we're not Raleigh, but if anybody, my sister mm -hmm. lives maybe two miles from North Hills, mm -hmm. and she's lived there for 20 years, and if you've never, just, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. There, there's no shortage of <laughs> examples in the tier one population cities of mall reinvestment and redevelopment. I mean, yeah. we have so many things to pull from. Mm -hmm. We are unique in our place in the marketplace, the scale of this market, uh, and the success of Elmore in many ways. So we, we have to think just a little differently. Um, and May Search has been very open to that. Uh, they've been great to work with so far. So we, this is definitely one that's on my radar for this year. Um, and it's not in here as we talk into the next ones, but it, it kind of ties to Mid-Brady is North Brady. Um, you know, as you get to the Hotel Davenport property and up, uh, and there's some interesting properties there. Uh, we as a staff have started to talk about that Northern Brady Gateway to uh, from a land use and, and viability standpoint. So it's not in here, but I would suspect we'll probably start to bring that topic area to you all sooner than later. Um, Rockingham was a little bit of our pilot. Uh, before the zoning ordinance got passed, we were looking at the kind of the commercial viability of that corridor last year, um, brought that zoning ahead of the full zoning ordinance. And um, what I would suspect, and Sarah and I have started to banter it around a little bit, is starting to really market these corridors and create the uniqueness because each of them has a little distinction from the other. Um, and I don't think we found the sweet spot on Rockingham yet, so our work is not done yet. Don't be cheating. I have slides on that, my friend. <laughs> Coming up soon. Um, and then the same with North Elmore. Uh, we have a great, great plan in place there. Uh, part of it's about the market being able to come and, and deliver us the products we want to see. Uh, Sterilite, if you haven't been out there, at least once the roads are a little more passable, go. It is a really, really large building. Uh, but essentially they're fully operating and, and the building itself is done. Our project for this year is really focused on getting the rail and the spurs into the plant. Um, I'll run into that. Just to continue to thank you guys because you're the ones that went out to Massachusetts and you're the ones that led that effort. And I'm sure a lot of discussions about a lot of things, but it didn't happen if it wasn't for y'all being there, going there and bringing in yep. work. So we, we have a fun picture of Bruce, Suzanne, and I in, in yep. Boston that will break out someday. <laughs> Uh, but so you'll see the, the last of this, and then Sterilite will essentially come off the work plan because once the rail's in, we're, we're in a good spot. Got a timeline on that? Um, EDA being shut down wasn't helpful for our time frame, but I think we're breaking ground late spring, right? So just some months on it. And our partnership, and the mayor was part of this, our partnership with the elders was huge in being able to get this project done and, and some of the property owners up there. You know, I think one thing, it may be good to note, and I think for the for all of us, well, everybody knows, but we hear a lot about why didn't this go there? Why didn't you have that go there? It all comes down to a private landowner and a private company wanting to do business, and we help facilitate what they want to do, but we can't mandate what a certain you know, retailer or restaurateur wants to do. They want to go there, and that they've done their market study, and we can assist them, but we can't necessarily, why don't you get that to be built over here? Well. Because they didn't want to build it over there. <laughs> you can stop so them, but understanding then they that we can help and support. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, areas that are ready to go. Yeah. And that's the idea of, of having a creative economic development toolbox because there are certain behaviors you want to induce, and that's how we can induce. We can we can influence those decisions. There are times when the market feasibility just says, nope, I'm going there, and there's there's nothing you or I can say to change that. Um, but building our toolbox so that we can induce the behaviors we want is something we've all been talking about for a while. Um, this one's a little a little fun. It was a big year. Kraft opened, Costco opened. Um, I realized if I didn't put Portillo's on there, Brandon would probably kick me. Um, but so a lot, <laughs> lot of great investment. Um, and these new to market retailers, we, we can't underestimate how important that is. That means our region is on the radar of 
kind of these national site selection firms in terms of a market that is viable and where these new retailers can go and be successful. Uh, we reviewed our TIF policies and URTE. You all adopted that in the fall. Uh, that's something that impacted 15,000 different properties in Davenport, uh, something that hadn't been revisited. Again, we will operationalize that to make sure every five years or so we check in and make sure uh, the areas are right and that we're encouraging the right kinds of behaviors. Uh, and then one that you all don't see, but the staff sees every day is our P card system implementation. Uh, we are we are into the century now, which is awesome. Uh, but it makes our ability to conduct business so much easier uh, for all the staff. So that was a huge one operational. Well, this where I have to crap, nope. <laughs> Patience, my friend. <laughs> How about two slides? <laughs> Uh, so, welcoming neighborhoods, uh, we probably couldn't devote enough time to talk about urban revitalization. It is very much an elephant we have to do one bite at a time. Uh, so we did a lot of foundational work in 2018 and 2019. I think you'll start to see some of the programmatic ideas and work and initiatives come before you. Um, probably in the pilot stage, because at 200,000 and 500,000, that's not going to turn an entire block or an entire neighborhood, uh, but we can start to to test some of these creative inducement strategies <coughs> to, to reinvest where our neighborhoods need it the most. But I do want to point out, and I think this gets forgotten because it is operationalized, we built the five urban homesteads, so brand new houses in the neighborhoods that need them most. Uh, we rehabbed 12 owner-occupied houses uh, and provided down payment assistance to 33 people. So th these programs are available. Uh, Sarah and I have talked about this as well, that we actually have a lot in the toolbox. It's just not packaged nicely and, and user-friendly. And so that's something I think you'll see us work on, again, as one of the initiatives at the end, that a lot of the tools are here. They're just maybe not easy to understand or easy to put together unless you engage with our staff. So we want to make that a much better experience for people who may want to do it. All of them and done. That building. <laughs> Um, so, as you're aware, we did send the notification to Kraft uh, to proceed in accordance with their economic development agreement. Uh, so that means they have to have their demolition permit pulled by March of 2020. So a year-ish from now, <coughs> if we don't see activity, I'm sure we will all be much more engaged. Uh, but we have a, a legal binding agreement with them that we need to allow them to at least attempt to complete. Uh, this isn't an opportunity zone area, so I know there's a lot of attention being paid to it in certain real estate circles because that opportunity is a really large one. Um, but I have this actually on two slides because you can see the importance of this facility to the overall neighborhood. But if you look at the next one, you can see the magnitude of the real estate. Um, and it is a gateway both into the west side of Davenport as it is to downtown. So if you think about the pivotal nature of the mall property, this one is equally important to the downtown. Um, once they pull the permit, how long will that be? 12 months. So. February of 2021. It should be gone or we'll be having different yes, conversations. Or March of 2021. Right. right. Yep. And so that's one where as time goes on, I mean, it's been fairly, Bruce, fairly quiet on my end, I think fairly quiet on yours. Um, but as we get to this point next year, if it's still quiet, we'll probably look a little more panicked. I think <laughs> and we'll talk to you before that. Yeah. Yeah. Or I will talk to you before then, because yeah. I'll be getting panicked by then. Um, but we will continue to reach out to them probably every three months or so to make sure they haven't forgotten that we have an agreement with strings on it. Are there still a turnover of people from Dalian as well? I haven't heard of any more new ones, but it's a big corporate structure. They move them around a lot. So that's why every 90 days or so we'll, we'll keep reminding them. And there was state money was involved. There was mm -hmm. a lot of things attached yeah. to this. State and ours, yeah. Everything's tied neatly together, and we, I think we're in a good place with the people on their side that need to know what they need to do. So, um, but where we go from there, uh, we've started to talk about um, there is an opportunity to work with the EPA and the DNR to do some master planning, and they have a program that they would do in partnership with us that ties to the cleanup and what, what future land uses might be, and, and they actually do some land use planning as part of that program. Uh, so that might be something we look at bringing forward too. You know, that's the future down there is so important to the west side. Mm -hmm. I don't. That should be, <coughs> if not the number one priority on that redevelopment. Mm -hmm. The revitalization is huge for the west side, mm -hmm. particularly. And I know. 
I know that there will be different concepts and that there will probably be housing concepts that come up. Um, I think jobs is really important, um, and I'd like to see something there that brings jobs uh, because a lot of people in Southwest Davenport they want to live and work in Southwest Davenport, and when those jobs went to Northwest Davenport, um, I think our focus should be on giving them opportunities to live and work in the same neighborhood. Yeah, well, that's, it's a unique site from a utility standpoint. I mean, you have a substation next door and you're really close to the sewer plant. From, from an asset standpoint, there aren't many sites better. It, it is challenged by flooding, but again, that's an engineering solution. Um, the, the plug and playness of this site for an employment use or a commerce use is, is better than pretty much any in town. So, so could, I mean, so we should be, uh, we're gonna, we will be planning, uh, begin to plan and vision over the next, I mean, because do we have to, we can do planning even if that, we, we know the land's gonna be there, right? Mm -hmm. So we can begin to do some planning prior to whether or not they pull their permit? We can, we'll look with the DNR and EPA about what the regs are. I mean, I, I caution how much planning we do when we don't own the land because there is a fine balance between what we desire and what we can mandate. And so I'd wanna make sure we partner with the EPA and DNR, because there are some certain cleanup restrictions. If somebody wants to propose re uh, residential, you have to clean to that stage. And that stage is much more costly than industrial commercial. Um, so I think this is very much a year of conversation and, and a little bit of dreaming and maybe some planning. But until we know where we are a year from now, it might be a little premature. Now, as I say that, maybe there's a big developer who wants to come in tomorrow because of the opportunity zone. We're ready to react. Um, but I, we have so many big priorities. I want to make sure we're staging these right. <laughs> so. Fast approach. <laughs> Pretty sure that'll be by the freeway. Yeah. Sorry. Primary location. So. Uh, the river. There you go. It's, <laughs> true. It won't fall off of our site, but it probably isn't in the top two right now. Um, so zoning code rewrite, uh, that was a Herculean effort. I know for CPED staff and they're ticking and tying the last few pieces as far as the user panel, uh, but we're in the, the last stretch of the publication period and then that will become effective. And um, I can't thank CPED, Bruce and his staff. I know Matt and Ryan and the whole gang had been working on this tirelessly. Um, and you think about the things that impact the city 30 years from now, this is one of those things, and it might not seem like it today, um, but it really sets us up to be successful for the future. I think this is absolutely the kind of stuff that, this is the kind of stuff that I was excited about going to getting on council to help work on, because this is the kind of systemic change that will really, it, it seems small now, but its impact will just continue to grow and grow and grow. Yep. And then Rich talked a little bit about the rent, rental ordinance review and revision and, and updating that, which was long overdue. Uh, high performing government, uh, this is our second year of working with you on a legislative strategy uh, and being more engaged in Des Moines. And I think we've seen some of, of the progress there. We have a long way to go. Uh, and we're right in the season, so this will continue to be active for us. Are we um, working at all? I know lead is something that we've talked about some. Are we working at all on lobbying to get and help us with lead cleanup abatement? Or so that's as much a federal program, and okay. there's a county group and some of our CPED neighborhood services staff. Um, that, much like urban revitalization, is a really, really big topic that's really hard to tackle. Okay. Um, so what we might think might be an easy solution might have really catastrophic unintended consequences. So we're, we're working through that very thoughtfully. We have staff working on okay. it. As um, long as somebody's working on it, I'm, I'm content. And there's a couple of elected officials involved with it too. Yep. So yeah, there's, that's not one with instant gratification either. So. Yep. Um, I talked a little bit at the beginning. Uh, the next couple slides are on, on our talent. Uh, chief Carlson took over as fire chief earlier this year. Mallory took over uh, HR and, and Chad joined us. Um, could not be more proud of our department head team. They are just phenomenal, um, dedicated to the concept of we instead of me. And so you see that common ownership across the city instead of just one department. Um, so really proud of the team we have in place right now.
mm -hmm. the workforce so they can stay with us and become new 100 years down the road. Yep, and I know economic development staff works particularly close yeah. with their organization around workforce development, the educational pipeline. There, there's a whole group that are working on that because we know, I mean, we see that as an organization and we know our employers see it that finding the right people with the right skills is incredibly difficult right now. And in many cases, that doesn't mean you need a four-year degree. You just have to have to be interested and show up in some cases. Um, Bringing all our schools and our yep. apprenticeship people and all those people together to do that. Yeah, and we've seen such great success with some of the programs at West um, that we get recognized for, but we need to keep growing that. And th we've talked about that at the Quad City First Board as well. So. Um, a, probably a little over a year ago, we had talked about the idea of a Davenport Strengths Institute. We are now in cohorts three and four. Uh, so this one's gonna fall off. This is completely operationalized. What's been really fun to watch, so they're cohorts of 15 that come through completely cross-departmentally, so vertically and horizontally different, and we never let a supervisor and an employee be in the same class together. Uh, but you see the relationships in the organization clicking all over the place of people who didn't know they had these resources. and. Um, so it's been really fun to watch that really come to fruition and our staff really take the idea on that uh, we're all here for each other. We can, you know, I might not be good at something, but Brandon's really good at that, so we should partner. Um, what's that? Yeah, sure, Hector. <laughs> I would not be good at yeah. that. He would be fantastic. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, coming to a cemetery near you, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but having a staff that really recognizes I don't have to be perfect at everything, I just need to know somebody who's good at it, and we're going to work together to make it great. Uh, so that's been really fun to watch. Um, what's that? It's an inside joke. Earlier. Yeah. If, if he starts popular. twitching, Too though, jokes. or we get a call from Tom, it's going to be popularity. a clue. Yeah. <laughs> Um, again, one of these back-end ones that really won't impact you, but is a huge asset to our organization. Uh, we have a very large network full of images from decades gone by where nobody would have access to anything else anybody had, and as people transition out, their image goes away in the computer, and so did everything they had. Uh, so we've been working with the departments to get everything into a centralized image directory so that we have history and current things, and especially as we talk about some of the, the next generation communication stuff we're going to be working on, it's it's much more efficient than me sending 22 emails saying, do you have a picture of this? Uh, on the same vein, the intranet, uh, Matt Thompson, who works up in our office, rebuilt the intranet to kind of mimic the greatness that our new website has. Um, it was pretty stagnant. Uh, now it's really cool. News comes into it. We celebrate anniversaries and birthdays. Uh, it's just such a great resource for our employees, uh, and it it's nice to have it as, as professional and amazing as it looks, considering somebody in-house just whipped it up in a couple of weeks. Infrastructure. Um, 76 and vets. I know there's a little bit of cleanup work this year, but the, the major pieces of those projects are done, so they will fall off the work plan. Uh, the mayor and Brandon both kind of touched on the 2080 and the consent order with the sewer system. Someday maybe this bowl comes off. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we'll we, we work tire, tirelessly at it. Um, the time that that project is, yeah. is just a We can hope, right? When I get, when I get the sewer is just perfect. <laughs> we'll be good. Um, I will <laughs> get Brandon a real check mark for that day. Yeah. Um, and then the I-80 widening's on here. This is, again, much like the, the industrial park that it's not today, it's not tomorrow, it's maybe five years from now if we're lucky. Um, but DOT has started the, the design and planning phase, which is huge. Um, but for us to have a widened I-80 from the river all the way into uh, Iowa City and ultimately onto Des Moines uh, is just huge for our economic growth. And, and we are well aware of how many pinch points are there, especially at Brady. Um, so having that new infrastructure in in the long run. So this one won't come off for probably 10 years, and that's okay because we'll get there someday. That's another one when, you know, I know I've been in, at the IDOT in a number of situations, so is Mayor Gallagher. We need to keep bringing that forward to make sure, you know, we stay on the list and keep moving up the list. So. It's, it's a don't get forgotten kind of thing yeah. because everybody else wants the money too. Yeah. Uh, multimodal study, I think this one's headed to you probably late spring uh, for kind of the, the council level wrap up, uh, but we have a, a great plan there. And then 53rd, Brandon talked a little bit about it. Uh, it's not going to be fun. Vets is open. It's fantastic. 
Um, but this, this will be a huge, huge project for our community and the mobility of our community once it's done. Uh, clean water, Amy had come before you with a couple different things on the programs there. Uh, so all of the programmatic things are done, so now it's the implementation. And I just grabbed a screenshot off the website because I don't think people realize just how much is at their fingertips if you just go look. And so there's a lot of great information about some of our cleanup and our clean water programs right there, one click away. Vibrant region. So Main Street Landing, and we talk about this one a lot, um, but as we we finalize now in this calendar year, the N5 lot, the plaza lot, um, whatever you plaza. choose to name it. We'll, <laughs> I think this is a year, and Chad's <laughs> talked to us, you'll probably name more than one park this year. Uh, but we're working on... What's the other one? Uh, well... Chad, what do we have? We have the Jersey Farms Park and the Marquette, right? Yeah, so there are some things that just have names that aren't really names. Um, and so they should probably have real names instead of just weird things we call them. Um, so that we'll talk about. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time talking about kind of finalizing this, this phase um, and then having the appropriate level of celebration once it's open because it's really gonna be a fantastic space. But in true staff form, we're like, what's next? Uh, and so we've been meeting and talking about what is the logical next step, knowing that these aren't one-year projects per se. This is really kind of a planning year and a design year implementation and opening. Um, and what staff is recommending at this point for council consideration is moving forward with the idea of a world-class playground. We've made this investment in the plaza lot. The next natural step, I think, from a development standpoint is to do something that will attract people here every day of the week for 12 plus hours a day um, and we've been looking at different models around the country that these fantastic playgrounds that are multi-generational, they're not just for little kids, they're not just for big kids, they're for the whole family. Um, people will come from 60 plus miles away to come to these things. Um, but this is important to do right. And so this is a, a fairly logical planning year for us to tackle that. In the master plan, if you remember back, the, the play structure area is directly south of the plaza space, so you start to create some holistic development together there, um, where the two sites could really work together uh, to create some, some really vibrant energy in the park, which is, I think, what our collective goal is. I think this is a, a great next step in, in the Main Street Landing process. Um, Main Street Landing's kind of the thing I, I really want to see happen. Uh, in any, any city that I go to, I try to find their signature park, I visit it, and then I, I try to see what activates the space, what brings people there. And if you go to great parks, great playgrounds, there are people there all the time. <coughs> That's what we need to get some of the other stuff done. We wanna get the building at the end of the Sky Bridge done. If there's people um, at Main Street Landing already, that makes it easier for us to get that next development step done. So get, getting people there is important. I think a world-class playground um, is a great way to do that. I, I would say we need to s set the bar high, though. Um, it needs to be the nicest playground in the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're going to go to a nicer playground, you're going to have to travel to uh, Millennium Park in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, and th there's, and, and I've showed, shown Corey some, some different examples, but I use uh, Smothers Park in Owensboro, Kentucky, a town of less than 50,000 people. Um, less than 50,000 people, if you go there at any, any given time, there will be over 100 people um, at the playground, and that would be the bar. I, I don't think we should have anything less than that. Um, and I think from a place, as we've talked about it as a staff group, from a place in our community, this, this as the next phase offers a really unique opportunity. Uh, we can partner with the Riverfront Improvement Commission, we can partner with the Parks Advisory Board, and with Davenport Schools kind of undergoing the transition it is, there is nothing more important than I think engaging our youth in this conversation and really creating some excitement around it. So we've, we've viewed this as a, a real community engagement opportunity to get a lot of voices, a lot of non-traditional voices involved in this conversation to create some excitement around it. Um, there is an opportunity for CAT grants, so the community, Attraction. what it's called, attraction uh, that we could go at and you know hundreds of thousands if not a million dollars uh, where we could leverage our investment uh, if we put the right proposal together. And I think it's important to note this isn't a, you know some swing sets in a 
teeter-totter thing, you know. <laughs> when we think of playgrounds and thinking of that, this is something, like you said, Millennial Park is a playground. But yeah, they're, they're not a swing there, you know, and it, but that's not what this is, an area where people come together and play mm -hmm. in a variety of different levels. So I think we need to make sure that people don't get off an idea we're going to make, you know, build a traditional playground there. This is something unique that we're looking to do. There is nothing even close to this in the community, yeah. or at least that's what we've conceptualized. You, you, I understand where Alderman Griff uh, is focused on that, but to invest this much effort and this much money in a playground <laughs> will have a huge negative impact on historic playground at Mother Goose, one of the great children's center that has been neglected because of council's actions in the back past. And then we've got the spray facility <coughs> in the park to put a marquette that during the summer you know, it has hundreds of kids and their families there every day. You know, we're going to rob from Peter to pay Paul. You know, I'd like to see some of this funding go to a historic park like Mother Goose and continue to develop the park we have for the last 15, 20 years out the foot of Marquette. You know, our riverfront is great and it's pristine right now since the dock has been Questioning some of the focus and investment council is looking at at the riverfront at the cost of other parks. We really invested a ton in those parks, though. I mean, we just oh, did the we did the spider itsy bitsy spider. We did um, the clock thing. You know, now my brain is. Well, the only yeah. thing I, I would share very quickly. I know all of them. That's in this moment. Very quickly, we're actually comparing apples to oranges. Yeah. Uh, just you know, well, the type of park we're talking about, the ones that that Alderman Griff is referencing and others, I mean, for that matter, the area where the arches in St. Louis is a playground, and that's not the same kind of a thing that yeah, well, I would say we don't necessarily sacrifice the mother goose and those kind of things. Those are unique and have a purpose. We need to have something that people talk about coming from around the country to come and see, and it, and I think that's important. Mike, you were going to go ahead. So I, I did spoke with Council. I certainly agree with Alderman Griff on the got to be the third. If we're going if we're going to do this, I agree 100 percent that this has to be the the leading thing right. forever. I keep going back to people who have been here a long time and how that this river transitions. The riverfront is our number one attraction, and if we're going to do it, we're, I agree 100 percent, and that's the challenge to you guys mm -hmm. that we make this the awesome. This mm -hmm. is in combination of, and then adding your historical. I was there, you know, because this is talking and thinking. As the dock was there, or as it, there is a historical piece there with the the first bridge close by, and the dock as the first veterans organization on, on this side of the river. That's what that place was. We can add a historical piece mm -hmm. to that. That's why thinking about this area could be all over the place. And his point about being big, heck, we can bring in tons of ideas to make this, when somebody says it's a playground, or it's a millennial park, or it's a, a historical perspective, or it's this, but because it's on a river, blah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. everything. Yeah. And Comprehensive. And we do need, uh, we do need public-private partnerships, Absolutely. so it has to be, Absolutely. we're not going to be able to do it all alone, and we shouldn't, and most of those areas aren't done by just Absolutely. public funds. So you were going to have yeah, it, yeah. And, um, I've talked about this a lot, so I, I think you, you have uh, levels of parks, and, and there are parks like uh, uh, February and, and Northwest Park and um, uh, Vanderbeer, and, and we've got a handful. We've got a handful of these. What I would I said are signature parks, and I think those signature parks should have upgraded facilities, like we have been doing at, at February, which is a signature park of the city, which is different than a regional anchor where you're going to be drawing from the greater Quad Cities and some of these cities, I would have never stopped in Owensboro, Kentucky and, and spent a night on their riverfront if it wasn't for that park. And we did, and that's that's what they do. Um, and so they're just different things and I don't think we don't support um, our older parks, 
our signature parks. I think we expand what we're doing there, which I've brought up several times over the years, and then we differentiate them between our, our neighborhood parks, which are the ones where we're putting in the $30,000 and $40,000 place set, uh, and that's pretty basic. Uh, the other question I had was, do we have status on the, the build grant or timeline? Mr. Mayor? Uh, the build grant was actually released in December, um, and we were not, uh, unfortunately, didn't be able to receive it, but we're waiting. Uh, the shutdown kind of hampered our ability to talk with USDOC staff about what they thought of our proposal. Is it, is it was it close to what they're looking for? How can we make that better as we, as we move forward? So then, I mean, then we're back to, back to the square one with fundraising for Main Street Landing. Um, with that, with that money gone, and um, we've we've got to be better at it. The, the CAT grant is one way to get this done, but we've got to be better at state and federal grants, and we've got to start getting our community partners involved. I think the uh, riverfront art project that's going to be coming uh, back to the council and and the city soon. Um, we've got to start selling that to people um, because, you know, this was. I was in college first time I went to a public meeting on this and we we haven't gotten far enough on it we haven't gotten far enough in the last four years we've got to do a better job of selling it and figuring out where the money's coming from from a CIP standpoint we're, we're doing our part as the council saying we're committing a million dollars a year which is significant we're taking bites out uh, but this isn't going to get done without other revenue streams mm -hmm. and that's what we pray for the sorry at Memphis it's a great mm -hmm. river I just want to say, I, I mean, I've been on here for several years, too, and, and we've had this conversation, but yes, it's been a long time, but I do feel like we're getting somewhere now, um, and I do think this park idea is a great idea, but it's, as you guys have said, it's going to bring people, and then I think that's going to spark that conversation to bring more private entities down there who are going to want to be there, and the people are there, they're going to want to invest, um, and as we've seen Costco coming, we're, we're starting to be on the on that map for people to notice us. So this is only gonna enhance that. So I think this is a good start. I appreciate not jumping in and just throwing something together. Um, Cause we know we want it to be right. Um, I think that's important. So I think, yes, it's taken a very long time, agree. Um, but I do feel like we're, we're getting there. Um, I think this is the, probably the most um, work that, that we've had for quite a while. So thank you. Just quickly, if you almost need to find another name for it than a playground because Right now, I happen to be in the thick of raising kids, but five years ago, if you said our big idea was a playground, I would view that as a squandered opportunity. But done right, this will appeal to 20-somethings in all ages mm -hmm. and, and fit, will fit nicely in the 2030. My wife and I happened to experience it in Cincinnati, and we had no kids with us, and we revisited their riverfront park multiple times on our trip because, uh, again, done right, it will engage you and make you childlike if you're not uh, already... Uh, with kids. I don't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's important as we as we start to rolling out ideas, that internal internally as we have working ideas of things, they become a life of their own. And I think we need to be we need to be purposeful in what we call them, I agree. Like again, we came up and we were calling that a lot of the media were calling the flex lot a parking lot. Well, that's where I was starting I started throwing around celebration plaza. Because you can see that picture, you can see there would be celebrations there. Same thing with this. Mm -hmm. So we just need to be cautious because all of a sudden it gets a mind of its own and people start, you know, we don't have a sky bridge, we have a sky sculpture. You know, that would have been different if it was called it that instead of maybe what we called it before. So I think we need to be purposeful as we move into the next level. And, and Mayor, and Davenport's important. a city that's park rich. We have incredible parks. Exactly. And been through a lot of budget meetings and there's always been concern for the lack of funding on a lot of our neighborhood parks. You know, our core neighborhoods, our top priority is revitalizing neighborhoods. So our riverfront is great. And personally, and I spent a lot of time in the riverfront on my bike, but <laughs> it's never been this incredibly beautiful with the dock down and all the green space. So. Enhancing it, yes, but uh, you know we're a city of 100,000 people, and we're talking about comparing to Chicago and St. Louis. You know, let's 
and let's be fiscally you know responsible. You know. Twelve thousand population only. Yeah, we've but had uh, looking at the fact in the past we've had discussion. limited public private commitment from our community. Mm -hmm. You know, if the private sector stepped up to the plate, that'd be one thing. But until mm -hmm. we get that commitment. I think everybody's committed to the, whatever it's going to be, and I'm just saying as we do that, let's be mindful of even those inter intermediate terms because I think playground got people talking more, thinking of it as a playground. And I, we've talked about it a lot, and an urban playground is different, but some people that's basketball courts with chain nets, uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to. So that may be something we just think about because there's work to be done, I think, in this. And I'm somebody else has something? Yeah. Okay. I'm less worried about what we name it right now. I'm more yeah. worried about what staff's working on next. Big, so. Correct. <laughs> but I, I do Something agree extraordinary. With JJ, I, I think the semantics is important. Playground yeah. is not the right word. Playground is frivolous, is, is, is juvenile in our minds. We have to spend some time thinking about that early on before it becomes a sky bridge. Um, okay. And the other thing is, is just, uh, you know, I know we're working through this, but I think. You know, you talk about green space. Green space is important to us. We're a growing community. And, you know, Candlestick Park, you know, and Golden Gate Park, uh, uh, there's not a lot of <coughs> play stuff there, but it's a beautiful open area. We have a beautiful vantage point along the river, and I just want, we don't want to lose sight of putting things there rather than maintaining that as an area where people can enjoy the river. That's the focus. Well, let's keep in mind, come spring, we're going to see just how uh, intense the river can be. I've been through several floods since I've been on the city council. Mighty and uh, Riverfront development and dealing with the mighty Mississippi, that's two different things. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Next. So one of the council goals was really those commitments to regional partnerships. We did secure the deal uh, with the Putnam to arrange our long-term partnership with them as well as the Cultural Trust this year. Um, I think when I first started with the city, I wondered if that was feasible, and last year we did it, which I think is extraordinary. At, this, at the same time, we had uh, the five cities and the two counties work on the, the professional services agreement with Quad Cities first, something we talked about for a long time and ultimately got done. Uh, and they'll be back before you, I think, in March to talk about, you know, how they're meeting the metrics we've set up. Uh, so really stabilizing some of those items so that everybody knows whose responsibility is what, I think, was, was a big piece of our work plan last year. And you'd, you'd be amiss if you be remiss if we didn't say you championed the PSA Council. So thank you for that. <coughs> there was a lot of people involved, but you were the bridge out in front of that for the, the larger community. Uh, fiber and digital connectivity, this one's been talked about and conceptualized and everything for as long as I've been here and much longer. Uh, but you will see uh, fiber to the home happen this year. Um, and thanks to Brandon, who worked a whole lot of hours on all those agreements with Nicole and Brian and others. Um, but as we start to see this implemented in our community, um, this is a huge workforce development opportunity, uh, attraction opportunity huge for our employers. Um, to have this public-private partnership and to have done it in conjunction with Bentdorf is, is pretty extraordinary. Uh, so this, this is a moment of, of change in our community for the better. Um, and two of the fun ones, uh, which will happen in summer, um, and I did purposefully put Hoke in one of the pictures because he did a lot of the heavy lifting and fundraising and you know a lot of this wouldn't have been possible without him. And Chad has very smoothly taken over the reins uh, but opening up the Miracle Field and our partnership with Gabe's happening at Vanderveer um, for uh, those with challenges in our community, what great opportunities to, to be able to be much more inclusive uh, and have these assets for the city. So. so new for 19, because we couldn't do a two-year work plan and not add some more stuff. Uh, <laughs> where's the fun in that? Uh, so we as a, as a staff and uh, you as the council know that along the year many things come up, but here's what we have our eyes on going into 19 as well as finishing up a lot of the goals in 18, uh, some which will span many more years. Um, but the downtown parking study, you know, two of the ramps are full, one less so. Uh, what does on street look like? So we're through the, the securing a consultant process and really starting to evaluate. I know we had a lot of conversations about what is the right sales point in the garages 
do we oversell and then who gets the complaints when you don't have a parking spot or when the Adler has an event and no one, you know, what, what is that sweet spot? And, and none of us are subject matter experts, so we're bringing one in so that we know because it's easy for someone who's not part of our organization to say you should sell at 125% when we are the ones who get the complaints of why, why did you oversell my clock twice? Um, and so we want to make sure that we ha our policies and our programs are calibrated to best practices and making sure we can be good for the businesses in the neighborhood downtown, uh, but also not, not create conflict where we don't need to. Uh, Richard talked about a little bit in his pre- Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, even CRP, you know, Google came in, all those guys, they had this exact problem with rent. And what did they do? And they did an intensive thing to look inside the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fortunately, we're much smaller scale and probably yeah, easier. So but I mean, we all know the that the, the east yeah. side of downtown is underparked at this point because of a lot of the tourism activity happening. And so we, if, who thought that would be a problem? We like solving those. <laughs> um, Rich talked about the va vacant property registration. That's a program we want to stand up this year now that it's in the code. Uh, so we'll be working on that. Uh, opportunity zone marketing. So we're working in partnership with the downtown partnership and Quad Cities First. We have two zones. Uh, what does that mean? How do we attract potential investors? That kind of stuff. Um, the business license process, I don't think we've revisited it in a while. Been, yeah. um, and the world's changed a lot. You know, We used to license only retailers and not service providers, and uh, there's a lot of nuance in that now with online merchants. Uh, so Sarah and a whole large team around her are really gonna revisit making sure we are process friendly but also that we have good contact information for our businesses because that's not always true. Um, and so that we, we're just gonna revisit that, kind of like we did special events a few years ago where we're gonna break it, take it apart, and put it back together better. Um, the professional service agreement with Visit Quad Cities, uh, their new CEO's in place, Dave is fantastic. Um, this was always meant to be our next step. We'd get Quad City first done and then bring in the CEB contract next. Uh, so Brandon and I will be working on that this year. Um, census 2020 prep. Uh, you might not think it's a big deal, but for us it is a big deal. Uh, and it's really a two-year project, so we, we have a community engagement part this first year, uh, going into next year, and then after the census data is back, then we have to look at the council districts and the redistricting and all of that. So it's really a two-year project. And I, I just want to share, the more I've seen in being around the country representing the city, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it means a lot by from federal support, from a variety of activities, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure we get everybody counted, mm -hmm. and whatever we can do collectively and as a as a team. And I know CPED works on that. They're kind of I think they're the lead group of that piece of that, that, and then Public Works does Public too. Works yeah. as well. So we need to all get get on board because that's very important. Yeah, so. the getting counted thing is, you know, being a city of a hundred thousand is is a really really big deal, um, and I think we're in a comfortable spot. But I want to make sure we're really comfortable. Uh, because a lot of the a lot of the entitlement programs are tied to population and need, um, and we want to make sure our numbers are strong, so that we can leverage that. Uh, Long-term facility needs, Alderman Ambrose, we are here. Uh, so we we have three bigger projects that will phase in differently. The first of it being the fire training asset relocation. So <coughs> having a training center is a little different than their training facilities. Uh, so Chief Carlson and others were working on the relocation of those training assets to, I think we've got it narrowed down to a couple spots with the preferred one uh, that we'll probably bring forward to you soon. Will, they, will they be connected or possibly, will they be in the same site that the, the new the fire station? No. Okay. No. We've talked about it, but there's reasons where station three is going to go that make it not so desirable to have the training assets with was, it. Okay, that was a question I got this week and I, I thought that there was a, a possibility but I didn't know for sure what the service strategy was. We had, we had looked at it, and Chief, feel free to, to chime in if I'm going off course. Um, we had looked at it where we generally think Station 3 should go in the future, um, but because of the high traffic and the high visibility and the type of training they do, I think poor sec would be on the receiving end of a whole lot of somethings on fire calls or, um, and so we wanna make sure that where the training assets are relocated that um, it doesn't create some undue burden for, for the neighborhood they're in or, or that kind of thing. So uh, we did look at it and we'll probably still look at it, but I think we have a, a pretty good idea of where we're headed. So why don't you share time. that with us? Because it's not ready. Please. I only bring you, you things that are well, well hatched. In an upcoming conversation. <laughs> 
at a Tuesday coming to yeah. you soon. Um, we have been working on the site location for Station 3, getting that out of the floodplain. Uh, we'll continue to make progress on that this year. Um, and then one of the things we talked about you pre with you previously is the idea of a multi-purpose storage facility with the sale of, of the fire center, uh, some of the unique needs that Fleece has, the long-term failure of the Marquette facility and parks, uh, the idea of putting all four of our frontline departments in a shared kind of storage and maintenance facility makes a lot of sense in the future. Uh, because the salt barn, I'm guessing, is no longer being held up by salt. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-oh>. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, again, that's a longer range one. We have some ideas, again, as to location and, and some of the tools. But uh, kudos to the department heads of those departments on the collaboration that we each don't need our own, that we actually can work with each other and, and build something together. So that's pretty cool. Uh, public safety radios, this was in the CIP. Um, we've been working, both the chiefs and their teams, and SEC and everybody else, uh, to build the new radio system. It's a P25 compliant, so it's basically the Fed telling us you have to do this. Um, we've been working across state lines, so there's a consortium in Rock Island County and a consortium in Scott County for us to work together because our system needs to ping off of, just because of geography, we need assets in Illinois, just like Illinois needs assets in Iowa. Uh, so it is a two-county build. Uh, we have selected a vendor. Uh, SEC is our holding agency for the contract and ultimately the radio build. Uh, but it's been a great partnership, and, and we'll continue to update, update the council as we start to implement that. The challenge specifically to Davenport is a lot of our radios are starting to fail. Um, and so we're in this weird sweet spot of our new, we'll, buy, we'll probably have to start buying the new radios before the full contract's executed and everybody else buys theirs just from a necessity standpoint. So we're we're working through some of the intricacies of Davenport on is that. Is there a transition? I mean, is the next generation <coughs> stable enough that oh, yeah. what you get now will yeah. be good for So the new yeah, radios yeah, will be so much better that right. the only quirk for us is that we'll start the warranty period ahead of everybody else. Um, and so it's just a, it's more of a business issue for us than anything. But yeah, I mean, we have dead spots for both service areas and, and PD beeps on their equipment mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, that we'll start to introduce it. The new radios are so much better than the old system, but we'll work on both systems. So it'll work on the old system, and then when we transfer to the new system. As your representative on SAC, this has been one of the more in, uh, in detail discussion periods, vetting of anything that uh, because you have so many different government entities involved. Illinois people, all the small cities in Scott County, the larger organizations, Davenport vendor, so. Um, it's very well thought through, and that's important. I know more about public safety radios than I ever wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> as we turn the page, I don't know if we could observe this moment in time. It might be the last time that we as a council get to refer to the area formerly known as Wacky Waters. <laughs> <laughs> if we could sing the theme song together. If you want to go where adventure lives. <laughs> you started. Wacky Waters Adventure Park. I'll put that in a minute. My childhood we have is dying right now. <laughs> kind of like the conversations we have about Hotel Davenport. <laughs> memory, yeah, right? Yeah, um, and So I revised this <laughs> based on last week a little bit and some of the yeah. things we had heard about, but um, we as a staff are starting to create policy papers around issues that the council brings up. So we start to create some history because, you know, I think Alderman Matson and Alderman Ambrose the most of, well, we talked about this one time and we dig through files and we can't find it. So creating policy papers that clearly identify what the issue was at the time, what the data is, what the decision points were, uh, is a practice. So it'll look just like your legislative papers. Uh, and the first one being on the massage therapy regulations. The ordinance will be before you uh, February or March on that. Uh, but there's a policy paper that goes, you know, what's, what's the problem statement? What are we trying to solve? Uh, and then what are the solutions? Uh, but the other, and Nicole and I talked about these, are really tied to public works. So the idea of neighborhood street material specs, including life cycle costs. So right now it's the developer builds what the developer wants. Do we want to have more say in that? Should all neighborhood streets be asphalt? Should they be concrete? What is a life cycle cost? Um, we've never dug deep into that, and it's a good time for us to do that. Um, alleys, we talked a lot about alleys. So reinvestment strategies and solutions. Uh, so we can start to chronicle, you know, is, is a five-year fix completely acceptable because that state is better than the current one? Uh, those kinds of things. Neighborhood private streets, both the fact that we don't want to ever allow them again and what do we do with the ones we currently have. 
uh, because that's a, an interesting issue for us. Um, and then pedestrian connectivity on roadways not built to current standards. So we have a lot of rural road segments where you don't have stormwater, you don't have curb. Uh, do you put sidewalks in when you don't have those standards? What's the cost to put sidewalks in? We, again, we've got some unique areas throughout the city where this is, a, this is an issue that we need to dig into. Um, and then, poor Rita's not here for this one, she, but... She actually already texted me to ask me to bring up the East 13th Street Bridge as well as the <laughs> Elm Street Bridge. So... <laughs> so yes, thank you, thank but I, I am actually here listening in, so I wanted to make sure somebody brought up that. Well, I didn't get to share the look with you, that's all. So we did put Elm Street in. We know this is a, a project we need to tackle this year. We won't forget about 13th Street, but, you know, we have to prioritize which of these happens first based on the the magnitude of impact. Right, but our negotiations with the railroad does include 13th Street Bridge. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, we won't forget. No, it's a, okay. it's a twofer. It's just which one we invest in first. So. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Well, there's law around it, isn't there? Yeah. There Enforcing is, there is, it. Well, well, we have their attention. Yeah. 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 Well, we, we can certainly mention it to them and talk to them about it. I don't know if we can change them. You know, okay. Yeah. What, what can we do about it part right. of that right. <laughs> so. okay and last and certainly not least this is probably the the big nebulous one uh, we've talked with you conceptually about the idea of project gateway uh, it's it's growing in magnitude and scope and I think that's good um, but the idea of government accessible to everyone and and so this is an all hands on deck really forward focused ideology of how do we engage our customers how do we share our information? Um, you know, what worked in 1990 is just not going to be relevant in 2020. Uh, so we as a team, and this this continues to evolve. There are about a dozen of us getting together on Monday to really start to dig into this further. Uh, but one of the first things you'll see is we're going to implement Granicus. That's a sibling software piece to uh, Novus Agenda, which is our current agenda management. But with Granicus, we'll be able to tie the video to each agenda piece. Uh, we've already started recording all the boards and commissions. Uh, so being able to go to any boards and commission or any council meeting or any work session and look at the agenda and click on that item and be able to get there right now, uh, just from a user standpoint, will be fantastic for our stakeholders. Uh, oh, one more. Um, you know, we have this uh, recently added three, three-year-old uh, community engagement chair um, mm -hmm. that is kind of like a out on your own type of deal. Anymore. That this would be uh, a good project mm -hmm. for that. Uh, that yeah, happy to be involved with that. Yeah. We've, uh, Careful what you ask for. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the that's community fine. meetings and I have looked at redoing that and adding them to it. So yeah. this is a stage of that. So thank you. Well, and it's. Oh, sorry. No, well, that's okay. I just wanted to clarify that all of our boards and commissions are now being recorded. We are recording them. We haven't gotten everyone located in here yet. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. Uh, with the exception of the library, which we've been working with Amy and where they're at's fine. So we don't have any issues with that. Yep. Yeah. When is session recording? Recording right now. Uh, so part of that for when we're over at PD, though, um, and that's the last one, the technology upgrades, and we've talked about that with the CIP of your system in here, we'll be able to do that same Granicus recording from the smart book, uh, both here and PD and potentially a few other places in the city. So. We had a big discussion one year. Didn't we talk about this last year? <laughs> yeah, we had that, so thank you. Yeah. And, I mean, we've, we're all learning the system a little bit with this new system. It'll be super, super easy that any one of us can, can really run it, which will be, it should be great. And I think one thing we've all talked about, um, and I see branding on the list, and we're going to get to that. But Don't steal my thunder. I'm not. Uh, but brand management and marketing are also very important. This will be some tools to help us do that. Did I get it? Thunder. Sorry. 
<laughs> Thunder away. Um, so alert Iowa, if you think about the old reverse 911 and code red, and it's fairly cumbersome. And um, for those of us who are engaged with the school district, we got contacted about 17 different ways this week. Um, this is where the model's going to be able to, if I want a text, if I want a voicemail, if I want an email, if I want all three, if I want to know about this, that, or the other, um, Alert Iowa allows us that tool to both handle the, the reverse 911, the public safety urgency issues, as well as literally anything else you wanted to know. Uh, so Tiffany's been taking the lead on this, uh, working with all the departments. So if Parks wants to let people know uh, registration for spring soccer is up and people have signed up for that, out it goes, in whichever mean they signed up for. Um, so really great from a customer standpoint of I can pick what I want to know and how I want to know it. Um, and we'll have a really broad base on that. Okay. Uh, make, Brand sure they, oh, sorry. make sure they know how they can unsubscribe yep. from. <laughs> There's actually a little around that. Oddly enough. Um, so branding refresh, and I know the mayor and I have talked a lot about this, and this is one of, I think, my great pet peeves, actually. So if I had every department head come up here and we all put a business card down, I bet you would have about seven different ones, uh, yet we all have the same employer. Um, so when you think about how citizens or businesses interact with us, there, there's no consistent image, there's no consistent message. Um, it's kind of the Wild West. Um, and so our project, and this is a multi-year thing, uh, but probably all the way into logo redesign and, and just refreshing who we are and all of it. It's, it's a big project. Uh, Sarah and I have evaluated partnerships with University of Iowa, Augie, St. Ambrose, because we think having college students involved and even the Creative Arts Academy has, has some value, uh, but we'll probably need some private expertise in this area to get everything where we have a catalog of what we look like, how we, how we do things, all of it, because it's, it's literally across the board right now. Uh, social media, and I'll actually skip ahead a little bit. So we have some great tools, we just don't have a kind of coordinated management of them. Um, so I can't go to you, we have X amount, very easily anyway, we have X amount of users, you know, here are the things people want to talk about. And so part of this team coming together is building some best practices, building some standard metrics. Um, you know, we just stood up the fire department's Facebook page, I think a month ago maybe. Um, and Zach's been doing phenomenal stuff on it. We'll plan on standing up public works here shortly so that our major frontline departments have that direct access and then the city oversees kind of the umbrella of it. Um, so this is, every department is impacted, um, and this will grow into interesting places. Mallory and I were talking yesterday about how to recruit personnel, and some of the next generation workers we want, well, if we're using Facebook, we're not reaching them. We actually need to figure out how to get through Snapchat. Um, and so really starting to model our communication strategies towards the outcomes we want to achieve. Uh, which are just not conversations we as an organization have had and, and will this year. And, and this, is, this is several years of work, but getting everybody on the same page together, marching in the same direction is step one. That's great. So this is always my favorite closing. Touch on technology we kind of touched on it. No, no. So the technology upgrades are in the CIP and really revolve around all this. So. So, your city is thriving, it's vibrant, and it's strong. Fantastic. Thank you. Corey, fantastic. you got a great team and uh, been around for a while, and I'm just incredibly proud of the team and where the city of Davenport is today. Good job. I agree. Anything else that you would like to add? Uh, we sat here a lot. I sat here a lot of times. I think that's one of the things we thought. The one thing you're committed to is branding and marketing. People don't know how good we are. You know, not that we're out bragging, but we're out at least educating them about all the things that are going on. So that's good. Well, if there's no other questions or comments, meeting adjourned. All right, thank you. Good job. <laughs> Sam, can you run this up to Rita's mailbox?
Rita, are you still there? Yes. We're going to put your packet in your box. Yes, I heard. Okay, beautiful. All right. Bye-bye. I hope you feel better. No, I did not know Thank you guys. Yep, thank you. Yep. Are you on back already? I know you, you're, you're always very faithful of bringing it back in and turning it in, so we'll take it from you there. Aww. One back already. I'm going to hurry out of here so I can make it to... Oh, your basketball My basketball game, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, some basketball right. game. There you go. Which I'm coaching, which is good. Oh, good. Can be there on time. So, yeah. How do we move them? If you